Good afternoon, participants. I uh, see that people are still making their way back from the side event. But I don't think we can wait very much longer to get underway with the afternoon's activities. Uh, let me just give, give you a further reminder uh, to look at the lists on both sides of the room here. And uh, if you wish to attend the visit to the Atom Institute next Monday, please put a tick next to your name. We're going to move on now with a look at the international monitoring system, starting with uh, David Jepson, the coordinator of the International uh, Monitoring System Division, who will talk about the international monitoring system uh, purpose, status, and challenges. And following that, we're going to go straight into presentations on waveform monitoring technologies from uh, other colleagues in, um, <coughs> in the uh, IMS uh, division. Uh, Julien Marti, uh, Stefka Stefanova, Jim Matilla, and Georgios Haralabos. Uh, but we're going to start now with uh, David. So, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Cormac. And Welcome everyone this afternoon to the session, first part of the uh, session on the international monitoring system. I, I will be giving a general overview of the IMS. I won't go too technical because I have um, my colleagues in, the, in my division that will go into the uh, in depth in, into that respect. So I'm just going to give the general overview and I'll be reasonably brief. Okay, so the structure of my presentation, firstly I'll be talking about the CTPT verification regime, what it is intended to look like, and you heard about that I believe yesterday and also this morning. So then I will move on to the international uh, monitoring system per se, where I'll briefly describe the technologies and the status of the network as we've got to so far, and then the challenges in its completion and its sustainment, and to make sure that it's relevant um, for state signatories and what they want to do today and into the future. Okay, um, so at the heart of the verification regime is the International Monitoring System Network. This is a global um, distributed network of uh, monitors uh, over four technologies. And you heard this morning that those technologies are um, covering seismological monitoring, hydroacoustic monitoring, infrasound monitoring, and radionuclide monitoring. Um, the radionuclide monitoring is supported by 16 laboratories. And this is where the data is generated. That data is transmitted to the International Data Centre uh, via a global communications infrastructure where the data is um, collected, processed, analysed and products are generated for state signatories consumption. And the state signatories can, will use the raw data and those products to determine whether there's something of interest for them where they want to get further information on. And that's where we come to the third leg of the verification system, which is the on-site inspection. Now, the on-site inspection, as you'll hear later on next week, can only come into play 
after entry into force. However, what happens here if the um, a state signatory says, okay, I want to get more information about this event of interest and goes to the Executive Council and 30 members of the 51 seat Executive Councils vote yes, then an on-site inspection will take place um, in the expected party and if more information will be sought and gathered, upon which the state signatories can make their own conclusions and then decide what to do with that. So that's how, with the intention of how the verification regime is to work. Now, if we go to the IMS in terms of the treaty definition, you can go to Article 4 in the treaty verification. Here it explicitly states that the IMS is to comprise of facilities of the four um, technologies, as I mentioned just before. And that would be um, the data would go from those facilities to the International Data Center through this global communications infrastructure. Secondly, while the international monitoring system is under the um, authority of the technical secretariat, the state of the facilities will be owned and operated by the state signatories themselves. Okay, now, we mentioned this morning, um, at, in the panel discussion this morning, we talked about in the negotiations um, where they set up, what, what, what sort of network did the CTBT um, want to have? Something that was cost effective and efficient to do the job. And Ambassador Hoffman mentioned this morning that they settled on the four technologies, um, seismic, radionuclide, infrasound, and radionuclide. However, other technologies were also thought about, um, like for satellite uh, monitoring the, the electromagnetic pulse on top of those satellite systems and, and other means. However, they were seen at that time not to be the most effective way of doing it. So we settled, we settled on these four technologies. Now, also, that this treaty was to cover only three environments, so underground, underwater, and the, in the atmosphere, but not outer space. So it was just those are the, the environments that this treaty was um, to govern. Also, in the design of the network, you'll see here there's 337 facilities envisaged, and you'll see on this map that the distribution is very equitable across the globe as much as it can be with most of the land mass in the Northern Hemisphere. So we try to be equitable as possible in terms of detectability and, and, and or coverage in that respect. And in the design um, of the network, uh, for the experts that were designing this, the mandate that they, were, they took forward as a, as a guide to say how many stations do we need they wanted to be ensured that they could at least see a one kiloton well coupled explosion in any of those environments. Also, for the network to be effective, uh, or to be cost effective, um, was to be able to use facilities that were already present there. And a lot of the seismic stations that we have today did exist because in the advent of the um, nuclear explosions back in the late 40s, in the 40s, and then with the um, development of the wanting to monitor what was happening, we had the development of the seismic systems in, in the 50s and the 60s. And a lot of those stations there, that were there that, at that time have been used as part of the CTBT system so we could actually leapfrog from existing facilities in the system, made our job a little bit easier. Okay, um, these are the four monitoring technologies. Um, the first one being seismic. This is predominantly to monitor for underground nuclear explosions. So you'll get a shock wave and uh, the, the pressure waves that travel through the earth will be caught up on seismometers um, on, on, on that network. Second one is hydroacoustic, which is predominantly um, to monitor underwater. Infrasound to monitor atmosphere, uh, pressure waves in the atmosphere and the radionuclide to sniff for radionuclide particulates and noble gases 
that could be that would be released from a nuclear explosion, whether underground, in water, or in the atmosphere. And I'll touch on these a little bit in, in a minute. And as I said, there's a um, global communication system that brings the together all the data from the stations to the International Data Center, um, then is forwarded to the state signatories in fairly quick time. So data that is recorded at a, um, a station, typically we send packets in the order of 10 seconds, and uh, this is for the waveform technologies, and they will be recorded here at the IDC, you can process the data, but also that data can be available to member states at that time as well. Now, if we look at the, uh, I think it's good to look at the build-up of the IMS over the time. Um, Ambassador Hoffman said this morning in 1997, I think it was early 1997, when the CTPTO was established, that there was only, I think, six staff or something in empty rooms. There was nothing. And, um, and by 2000, just couple of years later, we had the first certification of some of our stations. So in a very quick time, we actually started installing, establishing, and then certifying stations. Now, what I mean by certification of stations is for a station, it has to meet certain specifications. We have a specifications um, that detail the technical requirements of each of the technologies to ensure that state signatories get the data that they expect from the treaty. So make, meet, uh, need to meet um, noise conditions, need to meet certain sensitivities or capabilities. Now from 2000 over the, is this working? Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, over the next 10 years, there was quite a rapid um, installation and certification program. So you're going all the way up to 2009, 2010, you can see up to probably 80% of the network had been established and certified by 2009, 2010. And then there was a sort of a leveling off, a gradual increase in the um, establishment of stations. And however, in the last several years, and I think this is um, piggybacking on the successful outreach from our executive secretary, um, we've been able to get to countries where we didn't think we would be able to make much um, um, leeway into and we've been able to build stations in those countries and now we're at 90% of the stations have now been installed and we expect significant um, increase maybe a few more percent in the next couple of years as well which is uh, really fantastic and hopefully we can get to on the far side of the histogram there is the final um, number of facilities 337. Okay, now, so what's the status today? So what does that look like in terms of what we've built? Now, this map is showing the status of each of the facilities in the network. The green symbols are those stations that have been certified. So um, we have 281 of those been, have been certified. The blue Ones are those that have been installed, yet to be certified, so we've still got a bit of work to do for those, but they themselves meet the requirements of um, the technical requirements as required for the treaty. Then we have um, grey ones. Network itself, um, due to its global coverage that we have today, it's, it's very effective, and you've seen that through the DPRK test, you've seen that on other significant events that have happened over time, like the Fukushima accident after the tsunami that happened in 2011, for instance. You also see how good it is in um, seeing meteorites that are impacting um, the, the Earth and its atmosphere as well. Okay, so just briefly going into the four technologies, there's um, the treaty envisages 170 seismic stations now, the seismic stations um, I guess is this essentially of a uh, seismometer, which is in place typically either in a vault, on a, in a pier in a vault, or down a borehole. So it needs to be uh, well coupled to the earth, and this will capture the, this will record the pressure waves um, as it travels through the earth and then transmitted into the, recorded on the seismometer and then transmitted here to the IDC. And um, 
sorry. And my colleagues will go into more detail on the technical aspects of this uh, in a few minutes. Now, with the seismic network, while there's 170 stations, there's a backbone of stations that really form the detectability of the network, and these are the seismic arrays. These are very powerful um, stations. Now, they're so powerful because they act in, in two ways. One, they, they're a spatial distribution you'll see in the um, lower right-hand corner um, of a seismic array. I think there's 10 elements or nine elements in that one. Um, it's a spatial distribution of seismometers. And what that enables to do is when we have a, a wave coming from an event, um, we have a coherent wave, this will be, um, you can summon up over all these elements, whereas any noise that may be existing at the site will be, um, will be incoherent. So but what it does, it increases the signal to noise. So it's like a, you know, like, like a radar as well. You can actually, you, you get improved signal to the noise, so very strong. Also, like a radar, it gives you a, a, an idea of where the signal's coming from, what azimuth, and, put, and also w how far away. So a, an array on its own can actually give you an idea of where and which region an event is coming from. But typically, we use more than one station, and we triangulate with a number of stations to get more precise um, location of an event. And tomorrow, when the IDC gives presentations, they'll go into how that works, or maybe later on this afternoon. OK, now, if you look at the capability of the seismic network over time, these three pictures show the detection threshold capability maps. Um, from 2006 in the left going through to the end of 2017. You'll notice here that the, um, it's fairly obvious in these maps that the detection capability is better in the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere because there's more seismic stations in the Northern Hemisphere due to the land mass, and that's expected. However, you see that the detection capability, um, and this is in the MB threshold, is around at the worst is around 3.5, 3.6, which is much better than I think the experts when they were negotiating the treaty in Geneva were expecting. So this is you know much better, so we can get much lower than this one kiloton that, than that they were um, designed the network for. Um, so maybe this one is not so clear and I apologize. For it. This is showing uh, the six DPRK tests on a uh, station AKTO in Kazakhstan. Um, they are showing the relative amplitude of the six tests, and you can see that the last one that occurred in 2017 sort of blows the rest away in terms of its size. Um, but if you drill into this, um, you, and especially for the third, fourth, and fifth events, if you have a very close look at the waveforms, you can clearly see that they must have been conducted in pretty much very close to each other within maybe several two, two three hundred metres because of the similarity of the waveforms. And this will be, um, I think Gerhard Graham will talk about this tomorrow, how we can actually use relative locations to actually um, find out where these tests may be. Also, the first test that occurred in 2006, which is the smallest one, measuring a 4.1 magnitude, this is where we didn't have a, um, we only had, I think, 32 stations present at the time. This was at the threshold of many of the stations on the network. However, it was clearly detected by at least 20 of those in the primary seismic network. Going to the hydroacoustic, this is for predominantly for monitoring underwater explosions. I was going to, oh, I won't go to that video. Um, um, so now the hydroacoustic network consists of six hydrophone stations and five T phase stations. Okay, they're, they're completely different types of stations. There's hydrophone stations, as you'll see on the figure to your right. Uh, consists of a triplet of hydrophones. No. One, two, th three. 
Um, and these hydrophones uh, are suspended in, at depths uh, 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 co coincident to the SOFAR channel. The SOFAR channel is the si sound far and reaching channel, uh, which if you energy gets into that channel, it gets trapped in that channel and propagates very e efficiently and it loses hardly any of its energy. So if you have an explosion in one side of an ocean basin and energy, get, energy gets into that channel, it will be seen on the other side of the ocean basin quite, quite clearly. So we didn't need to have too many of these hydroacoustic stations in our network to be able to achieve the required goal of our um, detection capability. Another thing that will be mentioned is, um, and quite often in some of the hydrocrystal stations, we have to have a couple of these triplets to, to account to, to make sure that we get complete coverage, but that will be talked about in some detail um, in a few minutes as well. Just some pictures of the installation. Now, these stations are the most expensive stations. These are the order of tens of millions of dollars each, and just due to some of the cabling to get out to the SOFI channel, it can be orders of 100 plus kilometers long and shipping time is probably the most expensive. And also we, we've got to ensure that when we put equipment out into the ocean that it, it is robust. So some of the um, electronics has to be really um, well designed, highly tested to at least have a 20 year lifetime um, to ensure that we don't have to go out and keep rebuilding these because of their expense. Um, and then if you look at the capability of the hydroacoustics, so this is just showing the six hydrophone stations. This is showing the acoustic coverage map. And you can see that the oceans are covered very well. As I mentioned, if you let off a charge of a several kilograms off, say, South Africa, that will be seen on the coast of Australia, for instance, on the west coast of, of Australia. So it just shows how strong this capability is. Now, if you supplement this hydroacoustic network with the seismic stations, the, which are the T-phase stations of the hydroacoustic network and the 170 seismic network, you, you're going to cover these oceans completely. Infrasound, this is to monitor the um, pressure waves in the atmosphere. Um, now, okay, so if you think the heart of, the, of, of this station is the microbarometer. Now, I remember um, when I was a young boy going into my grandmother's kitchen and she would have a barometer in their kitchen and this would have, you know, showed the pressure so you'd be able to tell whether there was a high or low coming through, whether it was got a cold front or a storm coming through. Now, a microbarometer is a very sensitive barometer and what it's there is to capture very small, uh, or it's capture any um, pressure fluctuation. And also if we're trying to get to things that could be of very um, small explosions, it's got to be able to see these. Now, to be able to do that and to minimise any of the um, wind turbulence that occurs around the station, we have to um, have a unusual looking, but it's effective um, wind noise reduction system. So you'll see in the pictures, the, the bottom two pictures, we have these... Um, these pipes coming out and we have these inlet ports. We do a whole lot of sampling of, of, of the air pressure at these inlet points. They all um, are connected to the microbarometer. And what that does, if you sum them up, any noise, uh, when local eddies or turbulence, typically they get cancelled out because they're not coherent. However, the pressure wave that you're looking for is coherent and that will sum up. So that's the beauty of, they may look like things from outer space, but they actually work very effectively. And the best conditions for these type of stations are typically where you have some cover, like a canopy in, in a forest, as you see in, in, in the bottom right, or even in, in snow, because you, you, you already um, reduced the noise that would be recorded. Um, this will be talked about in a few minutes as well. This is showing some detection capability maps. And the key thing I just want to point out here, because I won't go into some detail, is that it's very dependent on the winds. Um, and if you look at the, this is showing two complete seasons, a winter and a summer season. 
and depending on the wind direction will depend on the capability. However, again, this technology is far exceeding um, what we're expecting for in the negotiations. Going into the ray nuclide, um, this is the um, sniffing for ray nuclides, whether particulates or um, noble gases. And this is a picture of a particulate station where we have a air sampler. Um, this is something that will um, t take in air and particulates will be deposited on a filter paper. And this is collected for, for 24 hours. And then it, it's allowed to decay for 24 hours before going into, in a detector to get a, um, a, the spectrum of um, radioisotopes that are recorded on the, on the paper. Now, I've got a video for this to explain this. Um, a moment, let's go see if it... generates radioactive particles and gases. These radio nuclides are dispersed by the winds. They may travel long distances from an explosion. Radio nuclide stations are deployed to detect them. These stations are built in exposed areas as they rely on the wind. In an air sampler, radio nuclide particles get trapped on a filter. Once a day, the filter is removed from the sampler and compressed. It is left untouched for 24 hours to allow non-relevant radio nuclides to decay. The compressed filter is measured in a detector for another 24 hours. The result is information on the radioactive particles found on the filter. The detection of underground nuclear explosions is more challenging. Such explosions also generate radioactive particles and gases, but as you can see, the particles cannot escape from the underground. We have to rely on the radioactive noble gases as evidence. They see through the underground into the atmosphere and are dispersed by the wind. Half of the radio nuclide stations can detect such radioactive noble gases, in particular xenon. The detection process for noble gases is different. Air is collected as before, but only the gases are trapped. Xenon is then isolated and measured. Here you see everything again. Radioactive particles and gases arrive at the station. They are being sampled and measured in separate processes. Resulting data are sent via satellite link to the CTBDO in Vienna for further analysis. Okay, so now I'm just going to show you a quick picture here. This is the, again, as I showed with the Seismic Network, is the development of the, this is the network capability over time from the 2006 to the 2017 um, test um, with the particulate on top and the noble gas on the bottom. So you can see the massive improvement in its capability over time as we build up the network. Um, this will probably be mentioned tomorrow, but in terms of the performance of radionuclide, um, this is a very striking example. Um, in April 2013 at our noble gas system in Takasaki in Japan, unusually high concentrations of xenon-131M and 130, uh, xenon-133 um, were recorded. And the isotopic ratios of these um, suggested a fission about 51 days um, prior. Now, some ATM um, was done, and these detections were consistent with a late release from a DPRK, from, perhaps could have been from a late re release from the DPRK test site 55 days earlier, um, and which coincided with that of the nuclear explosion of the 12th of 
February in 2013. So, because a striking example of not just the technology but also the atmospheric transport modelling capabilities that we have in house here as well. And Yolanta will talk about this um, tomorrow afternoon in their presentation. Okay, um, so what are some of the challenges that we have in the IMS in terms of its establishment, its sustainment, and ensure that, mem uh, that state signatories are getting uh, what they want in terms of sensitivity and in terms of data availability? Okay, and first challenge is completing the installation and certification of the remaining facilities. As I mentioned, 90% um, of the network is now complete, uh, but we've got some fairly tough ones to go. So the main things here, the big one is political barriers. We still have a number of countries that are still, we've still got some work to do out there, and hopefully all of you can help um, champion the need to get these last stations on board. We are making progress, but it's slow, and I think collectively we can make an effort and, and make this happen. Even so, even making that happen, some of these last stations are in challenging environments. Um, you know, you've got the massive environmental regulations, they're logistically difficult places to get to. And also that comes with an, ex an expense. However, as I did mention, we've had a, quite an uptick over the last couple of years and we're going to complete quite a number of stations, but there are still some really challenging ones ahead. Okay, now, even though once we get the tick to build a station, there's quite a long process to do that. Firstly, we, we need to, firstly, get the host country to agree to build the station is the first one. And typically what comes with that would be a facility agreement, which will allow us to build that and then to operate that station into the future. Once we have um, agreed with the host country, a site survey will be taken. Now, site survey is very important because we want to make sure that we build a station that meets the technical specifications um, at the site. We want to make sure it's not too noisy seismically, or it's, we might want to check that it's got the conditions for reliable power or reliable infrastructures. Quite a lot of aspects that we have to look into. Um, if you get that wrong, you could have a, quite a poor station, and there'd be no point building a station there if it's not going to contribute to the capability of the network. Then there's the civil works. And as you saw from some of these stations, they're quite major undertakings. And they're not just in a, a lot of them are not just a single location. They can be a distribution of stations, like a seismic station or an infrasound station. Or they could be a hydroacoustic station that involves this massive cabling out into the water. So quite, quite a large um, effort is involved there. And then before we can bring a station into operations, we have to do testing. We have to test that we, we do the installation and then we do the testing that it meets specifications. And once that is done, we can certify the station and it'll be available into operations. I, in my previous um, employment, I was in Australia and the NDC, and I remember one of the station, infrasound stations in um, Western Australia it took an order of 10 years to go through all the permissions. You know, there was environmental, there was the um, community owners of the land, which was the most challenging to convince them that, you know, this was not going to be a detriment and it was not going to affect their cultural heritage and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that have to take into account and that's why it can take some time to build some of these stations. But we have learned a lot here at the CTBTO on how to do that more effectively. So. Hopefully, it doesn't, won't take so long in the future for some stations. Now, oh, can you click that? This is just this is just a one of my colleagues who will be up presenting tomorrow, um, Barbara Nagelit. She went on a journey to Kerguelen in the southern part of the Indian Ocean, and this was part of her trip out there, it's like a 10 day trip on, on this ship. Um, this was the certification of one of the stations there. So a lot of our stations are in these remote areas. And so we have to ensure that we build a station, we build it well and build it to last because some of these we can't get to for quite some time. And so if we don't have the right equipment there and built well, a station can go down, we don't get any data from it. Okay. 
So that comes on to the second challenge is sustaining the network. There's numerous actors in this regard. At the coalface are the station operators. Um, we rely heavily on them and we have a strong liaison with the station operators. Now they, they will do monitoring, you know, sometimes on a daily basis, the monitoring of the station. Um, especially with the radionuclide, if there's a manual change of the paper, they have to do that every day. Um, also, they will, if we here see something that may be not right with the station, we'll be lazy with them and they have to go out and investigate. Maybe they have to reset a computer or reset a digitizer, etc. Now, the station operator doesn't necessarily have all the tools. Um, they can't, um, not, doesn't necessarily have the full capability. So we actually have to help. We, we have, uh, our staff here have the capability to help with that, with the troubleshooting when necessary. Sometimes we have to replace equipment, and we have to have a very we have a very good um, connection with our equipment suppliers of getting fast supply of equipment to that. And then sometimes, if the something really bad happens at a station or the equipment goes um, obsolescent, we actually have to consider doing full engineering uh, redesigns. We could have, have had at some stations we've had lightning strikes, we've had to repair significant parts of the station or we've had a fire that's come through and destroyed a station and had to rebuild it. So there's a, a, there's a very, in, uh, very um, intricate um, liaison between a whole lot of actors that enable the sustainment. So it's an ongoing challenge and we um, are doing this, I think we're doing this very effectively, but it takes a lot of effort to do this properly. Um, one thing, um, just to give an idea in terms of building a station and then um, and operating and maintaining a station, there's quite a big upfront cost um, we, when we build the station. And then it goes into a phase where there's not much cost because it's, it's like, say, running a car. You book, buy your new car, then you run your car, you have to do battery, uh, you, know, you, you change your tyres or the, you're checking your batteries, your brakes. And then later on, the, 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 the station becomes old or your car becomes old and you're going to have to replace some more significant components. You may, at some stage, you might want to replace your engine because your body of your car is still pretty good. But there will be a point in time when the station has to be fully upgraded or recapitalized, and then we start the cycle again. And we, we um, put a quite a bit of effort in trying to understand the life cycle of the stations to maximize the life of, of, of a given station, but also we've got to ensure at the same time that the station go, doesn't go down. So there's a balance between how long we can run a station and how long and what's the right time to recapitalize and upgrade the station. The third challenge is continuous improvement, and you'll hear a lot about this in the coming talks. Um, firstly, we want, want to ensure that the data is, is relevant to the treaty. So we, we've got to make sure it's calibrated. And we, there's um, several, that one of the technologies, the infrasound, we, we're putting out this in-situ in -situ calibration capability, uh, which enables us to be able to do the yearly checks as specified in operational manuals. And that's moving forward as, as we speak. Also, we've got to make sure the member states are always want um, the sensitivity, improve sensitivity or improve capability. So we're always looking at the instrumentation. Can we improve, uh, lower the noise floor of the instrumentation itself? Or can we improve the sensitivity, e.g. with the uh, radio nuclear stations? Can we have an increased volume to, to lower the sensitivity or improved components to actually get um, increased absorption of uh, some of the, maybe the gases or et cetera? Also, um, we want to make sure we are cost effective, we're reliable and cost effective. So we're always looking at improving and, put, and, and keeping abreast of the technologies and improving our engineering solutions across the network. And that will be mentioned uh, in the coming presentations. Lastly, but not least, the data has to be available to the state signatories and be secure. I mentioned early on, we have this um, global communications infrastructure, it needs to be functional. Um, it needs to be, I think, our uh, mandated is 99.5% available. And in our, as we move, we're moving from the GCI2 to GCI3, and part of our new contract is to have a redundancy um, link. So we have two forms of communication to actually hopefully increase and improve the performance even more so above the 99.5% target 
um, to ensure we have data coming to states and industries so they get the data and the products that they uh, call for to make their own judgments. Now, the states and industries are also hungry for data and they want it now or they want it you know, yesterday, so to speak. Um, so we have to ensure that we have a robust technology infrastructure to enable that. So we're continually increasing our capability. We're moving into the cloud a lot more to ensure that we meet that demand from the state signatories. Lastly, but not least, um, the data has to be trusted, has to be authenticated. So what's recorded at the station is what they see on their computer at their national data centre or the national authority. So we're rolling out, um, we have some rolled out in terms of this um, authentication and we're rolling that out more and more. So that were the challenges. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Do you want to take questions now? You may as well. I'm happy to take a couple. I'm happy to I'm happy to take a couple of questions if you like before we get into the technical heart, if you so decide. Oh, in blue. Yes, uh, coming from a military background, I'm curious as to your day and how it went. If I could take you back in time to September of last year, um, I'm going to ask this question again tomorrow for the data center, but um, you at the, at, the, at the monitoring system, when that, the latest test went off, can you just tell us a little bit about your day? And I mean, it was roughly 8.30 at night, I think, when the September test went off. But uh, if you could talk about that, that'd be great. I, I, I The key thing is, is we, we're more doing the preparatory work. We ensure that the network's available before the test happens because it, it, the principal, um, with the first sign of the nuclear test will be on the seismic system. So if that's not operational then and there, we're not going to see it on those given stations. So we do a lot of preparatory work. That's why the sustainment of the network is so important. Then with the possible release of radionuclide particulates or gases, um, what we then do is say, we say, okay, if we have planned work that we were intended to do, say it's in the Northern Hemisphere, we say, let's put that on hold because we're not going to take a station down because uh, as, as a, a cloud that may have these radionuclides that it, inside it may pass over that station, so we don't want to be doing any preventive maintenance or planned maintenance at that particular time. So that's how our day works. So, okay, so when we get the call, I typically get a call from my fellow um, coordinator in the International Data Centre to say something's happened. And so I do my colleagues here, and we come in here to support the International Data Centre and um, in terms of when they look at the data and bring that forward. And then I think within, I think by 10 in the morning, we have, we call all the missions here in Vienna to come to a briefing, and, and we support um, the IDC in terms of that briefing. Did you want to? No. Yeah, I just, uh, the, the last one was, I believe it was in the morning, and yeah, the call from Gerhard came probably around 5 a.m. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Steven Herzog from the United States. I have two questions. One is really quick and one is a little bit more detailed. The first question is, is why do some facility agreements take so long to enter into force after they're negotiated, after the station has been up and running for a while? And the second question is, is my understanding has been that cooperating national facilities could not exist until entry into force of the treaty, but there have been discussions over prototype CNFs with Israel in 2002 and Italy in 2015 talking about um, possible seismic prototype CNFs, and now I'm hearing that Canada is going to be partnering with Kazakhstan to potentially have a radionuclide cooperating national facility. 
And I've also read that the IMS division is talking about preparing to be able to incorporate prototype CNF data uh, into the system. So my question, my second question is, is what would be the status of prototype CNF data prior to entry into force? Thank you. Okay, in terms of the first question, um, the facility agreements are only for those countries that host facilities. I think there's 89 or something um, countries. Now, I can't ask, I know that I think 49 out of the 89 have facility agreements in place. Now, I can't ask, answer legally why that is Chow Dong yesterday, maybe would have, would have been a good time to ask him that question on the facility agreement, so I apologise, I can't answer that. But each country has their own uh, reasons for that. Um, some countries may be the fact of, due to our preparatory status of where we are in terms of where our professional technical secretariats, I think some countries have that as a reason why they won't sign a facility agreement. But I, I really can't answer that particular question. In terms of the prototype CNFs, now, start with the prototype CNF is the data from those would not will not be used, you're correct, they don't come into play until entry into force of the treaty. So that's why they're called prototype CNFs. Now, those, um, any data that we bring in from those CNFs will not be part of products of the International Data Centre. And what we are doing, and the reason we, we're doing this at the moment, is we are starting to test our system. We're getting, um, we're, we're a long way in terms of preparation. We want to test the capability so when we come at the entry into force that we can test how uh, we can introduce a CNF into the system. So that's why we are working with them. Now, the, they do have benefits in terms of in, at entry into force. If we have more stations out there that meet, each, each CNF has to, or each piece, prototype CNF has to meet IMS technical specifications. So when at entry into force, um, these data can be called upon for consultation and clarification. So they really will supplement um, any, I suppose, um, call for an on-site inspection in terms of the data or their, uh, their presentation for something like that. Uh, thank you. Uh, how is the radionuclide detection facility determined between uh, xenon that comes from explosion tests and the radioisotope production while the two activities release the xenon gas? Thank you. I I mean, for that question, I'd rather leave that unless um, tomorrow that will be touched upon. There will be um, the experts, RN experts, will be talking about the radionuclide monitoring technology. They can go into that detail on that question. But I, I will not be able to answer that personally myself. I'm sorry. I can, uh, about Jim, Jim might be able to. Okay, so just real briefly, yes. So tomorrow morning we will have uh, an in depth presentation on that. But just to give you a, a very brief answer now, the uh, if you go back to 2013 and if you recognize that we actually referenced um, a ratio of two of the uh, xenon isotopes, uh, there is a, uh, I think there is a, an accepted uh, procedure to where you can look at uh, a reactor running and understand that a certain uh, combination of the xenon isotopes come out of that under normal conditions. And then if you look at the combinations that are uh, emitted from nuclear explosions, these are different. So uh, you can use this to uh, age date, uh, the time of the event, as well as the nature of the event. Now, uh, un under the most recent uh, discussions, there was hope to also try to do that to speciate and whether or not the last DPRK6 test was uh, a uh, boosted or thermonuclear versus just nuclear. and. That is an extremely difficult application of those same techniques, and there's much lower confidence when trying to do that. 
So, uh, so I think it's very good for doing the first two, but for doing the third, uh, that's pretty much, I think, a reach or a stretch right now to try to do that. But I think if that, uh, I'd say hold your question again for tomorrow morning, and we can go back into that. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a question? Are you okay? Sure. Right. I'm Didier Namogo from DR Congo, and uh, my, I have three questions specifically on seismic stations. The first, uh, in the presentations, you spoken about the primary seismic stations and the auxiliary seismic stations. I want to know the difference between uh, the two. The second question, is what is the purpose of the CTBTO to, uh, to install the seismic stations in countries which doesn't have nuclear or which doesn't use nuclear weapons? And uh, the last question, uh, in, the, in the presentation, you said that the host country must initiate the processes to get the station. Uh, I want to know if uh, this process must, uh, if the initiation must come only from go government members or it can come also from scientific members. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for your question. As you said, there's, um, primary seismic stations and auxiliary seismic stations. There's 50 primary seismic stations and 120 auxiliary seismic stations envisaged for the treaty. Now, the primary seismic stations, uh, they, they uh, create the detect uh, detection capability of the network. These are the ones that we receive continuous data from, uh, from, you know, from the stations here into the IDC. And these are the ones that will form the events, the initial detected events. Then upon once there is an event, we call upon the auxiliary seismic stations data from those. So we call for segmented data to supplement that of the, of the detected event to be able to give help with its location and also for event screening parameters. So, so we've got the 50 which will create that detectability of, say, the magnitude 3.5 across the globe. It, it, um, and the auxiliary science stations are not part of that initial detection of the events. And that's the way how it was structured in, um, in, in the um, Geneva. Now, you talked about those stations in countries that weren't part of the P5, I think, or something like that. Now, this. The, all the stations are listed in the treaty, and that was agreed to in the treaty. There's 170 stations, and that was, at the time, the experts who were designing the network, due to the mandate they were after, something that was cost-effective, um, to meet this one kiloton um, threshold, at least meeting that. Um, this was the best design, and a lot of it was also based on what was existing at the time. So that was the best distribution um, they believed there, and that's what was listed in the treaty. Now, in terms of working, in terms of establishing a station in any country, um, our first port of call is with the national authority. The CTBTO um, first works with the national authority. The national authority will then designate who, which agency perhaps, or which scientific institution upon which they may want then say, I would like you to be the one who's coordinating to build a, a given station. So, well, we always go for the national authority and that's somewhere in, typically somewhere in government. Thank you. Okay, um, let me go ahead and briefly introduce myself. Uh, 
I'm James Matala. I'm the chief of the engineering and development section in uh, the IMS division. And then uh, let's take a second to, and I'll introduce everybody to my right. So we have uh, Ms. Uh, Stefka Stefanova. She is a maintenance officer in our uh, maintenance and facility support section. And uh, uh, to her left is uh, uh, Julian Marty. He is the uh, unit head of the seismic and acoustic systems in the engineering and development section. And then immediately uh, to my right is uh, Mr. Georgios Haralabos. He is the unit head of our hydroacoustic systems also in the engineering and development management uh, section. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take uh, you just got an overview from Mr. Jepson and we're going to take a little more time and hopefully not too much repetition, but we're going to dig into each of these in a little bit more detail. And uh, so this afternoon will be uh, the uh, waveform system. So this will be the hydroacoustic as well as the infrasound and the uh, seismic systems. And then we'll finish up the rest of those uh, tomorrow morning and then get into the radionuclide facilities, which will be a combination of the particulate, noble gas, as well as the laboratories. So. Uh, uh, we have uh, lots of information uh, to, I think, uh, share with you over these next series of briefings. So I think what we'll do is we'll do it in a similar fashion where we just go through the slides and then uh, we can take some questions at the end of each and then move on and let's, uh, let's just see how that goes. So uh, I'll do a, a quick introduction just to touch on a few other uh, highlight areas that uh, uh, were not uh, fully covered in the last briefing, too. So. Hey, this is mostly for background, and I'm sure uh, most people are aware. You know, we've uh, last year we celebrated the 20th anniversary of, of this organization, which, uh, you know, slightly before that, uh, the treaty uh, came into existence, and you know, we've uh, we've made uh, phenomenal progress. Maybe not fully on the political side, but we're getting close. But I think on the uh, on the parts that are near and dear to our hearts, and that we're telling you about uh, the IMS side, we have done a lot. Uh, you know, the uh, the 90 percent established is is really a remarkable feat. But also, if you think about this just in terms of raw numbers, you know, we've established uh, I think 293 at the last count, and we have another. Um, you know, seven or eight or nine stations in the pipeline. So when you really look at the ones that aren't um, really started or TBDs, you know, we're down now to, uh, you know, this is maybe a dozen and plus a few. So that's all we're talking about. So this, this is really, really remarkable. And then during that 20 year journey, the, uh, uh, just the levels of the technologies in terms of the capabilities of uh, installing and operating and maintaining and getting data from these stations, we've been on a very steep learning curve. And so I think the times have been used very effectively. But these are some of the details we hope to share in, in the coming presentations. And uh, we're going to focus on the IMS uh, part of uh, the regime. We've talked about that. Um, you've seen that. This, uh, these last uh, two bullets that are being painted on here, this is, this is worth pausing for for a moment. So our waveform systems have this 98% uh, data availability requirement. That means for out of every year, you can have your station down for one week. That's a pretty high requirement. So what's really remarkable is if you look across the network, last year uh, or currently our infrasound stations as a whole are operating at that level, which is really, I think, a tribute uh, to all of the staff that operate, maintain, and establish these stations, as well as our local operator partners. Uh, on the RN side, uh, you have a 95%. And that means, OK, you can keep your station um, up for 50 out of the 52 weeks, but you also um, uh, only seven consecutive down days. So you can basically have. Uh, one long event followed by several other sporadic. So these are tough requirements to meet for any systems. And then just thinking about where we are all over the planet doing the logistics and sustainment for this, it's pretty incredible. And 
it actually works really well. And uh, this is, a, I think, a major accomplishment that, you know, when you think about this in the totality of the last 20 years, uh, this is what's being done. Um, yeah, so here's a cartoon. You can look at the slides. This is just, I think, Mr. Jepson covered that. So uh, I guess the good and bad thing about uh, nuclear testing is it's, uh, it releases, uh, you know, the reason why it's bad is because it releases things into the environment, and you could call these signatures, and then so we take advantage of the uh, physics and the signatures involved, you know, either atmospheric, uh, waterborne, or underground testing, and uh, because of that, these are how and why all of these various monitoring technologies are created. It's basically to exploit these things that the tests uh, will release, you know, and then so this, uh, this is the science and the approach behind why the network is what it is, why the technologies are, and why things are placed approximately. It's, it's a uh, mixing of all of these uh, needs versus the availability of these signatures, and I think it's a pretty good compromise when you look at the layout of the network and the use of the technologies uh, and the approaches of how uh, it all kind of sort of works, and from that we can do this global one kiloton anywhere type of an approach, and so uh, it's just, so there is uh, a bit of uh, method to all of this madness as well. And um, so, yeah, we uh, heard about all the technologies, and then the, uh, right now, if you just focus on the bottom of the slide, so we have uh, 40 of the radionuclide stations uh, will also have these noble gas monitoring uh, with them, and we'll cover that, uh, referring back to our one question we had in the last session as well. Uh, and today we'll be uh, finishing up in detail on everything in the yellow box, and tomorrow we'll cover uh, the radionuclide. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to my hydroacoustic uh, colleagues to give you more in depth there. So thank you. Good afternoon. Um, we will focus uh, on the hydroacoustic component of the international uh, monitoring system. Um, as you can see um, in this figure, a little bit more than 70% of the surface of the Earth is covered by the oceans. And in spite of that, only 11 hydroacoustic stations suffice to provide coverage for such a vast area. And the main reason for this is the extremely efficient uh, propagation of acoustic energy underwater. There are two types of hydroacoustic stations. The ones in the gray boxes, uh, they are the so-called T stations, and the ones with the white boxes are the hydrophone stations. What's the difference between those two? The hydrophone stations, they have underwater microphones called hydrophones that listen to underwater acoustic signals. The T stations, they do not deploy anything in the water. They are basically seismic stations at coastal areas. And when the uh, waterborne energy hits the coast and couples on the Earth's crust, then it gets picked up by the seismic station. So in a sense, if you wish, the hydrophone, hydroacoustic stations, they listen for acoustic signals, while the T stations, they feel the acoustic signals after the energy is coupled on the Earth's crust. And as it was mentioned, the signals that are received on these stations 
in a matter of seconds, they are here in Vienna and shared also with state signatories. A few things about the, the physics of the generation of a hydroacoustic signal. Um, as you can see, uh, we can have an underwater explosion or we can have a low atmospheric explosion and acoustic energy propagates into the water and it can uh, very easily be picked up by uh, an array of hydrophones indicated uh, there with the yellow dots and the signal um, through long cables uh, is, uh, will be transmitted to the SOAR facility and by a satellite to Vienna. More information will follow. Um, a typical example you can see uh, on the right hand side is a typical example of uh, an explosion signal and the two main characteristics is that it's very short in time and very broad in frequencies. So the color figure that you see there, the, uh, the horizontal axis is time, is very short the signal, the vertical axis is the frequency content and that's very wide. Also we can have an underwater, an underwater, uh, underground explosion and that uh, is indicated there as a T phase. When we have an underwater explosion, um, uh, you have of course the, uh, the primary and secondary signals propagating through uh, the earth, but also you have energy coupling from the earth into the water. You have the generation of so-called T phase the T phases are picked up, of course, by the hydrophones, but we do not have both hydrophones and T stations collocated. So when you don't have the hydrophones, then the T phase will, uh, when it hits a steep uh, coast, then um, through a very complex mechanism, then uh, the, the signal will be uh, uh, coupled on the crust of the earth and then it will be picked up by um, the seismometer that is shown there on the top of the ridge. This is a cartoon of a typical T station. Uh, on the right hand side, it's a top down view, as you would see from an airplane, where you can see the two stars. There are two um, seismic stations, basically, that will pick up signals. And then on the left hand side, you can see the two different paths that uh, a signal generated underwater. Um, and it's coupled also on the earth can follow. You can have the seismic path and you can have also the um, hydroacoustic path. The reason why these stations are called T stations is because the T uh, phases that propagate through the water, they come third. So the T stands for uh, tertiary, which means third, because the signal, the first two, the compressional P waves and the transverse S wave, they will propagate through the seismic path and will arrive first at the seismometer. And then the T phase is a signal that will spend part of its propagation path underwater. They will come late because it travels, of course, slower in the water than um, uh, on Earth. And, and that's why they call T phases. Now, the main component, though, of the uh, hydroacoustics uh, network are the hydrophone stations. Um, it was mentioned previously that uh, the hydrophone stations consist of uh, triplets. And you can see there in the cartoon, uh, first of all, on the right-hand side, the top-down view, um, they are typically uh, deployed on both sides of uh, an island. Exception is uh, Australia, which has only one triplet. And you can see uh, a long cable to the north and a long cable to the south ending up in uh, three hydrophones, a triplet of hydrophones, as we call it. And the reason why we usually have two is that for the acoustic shadow of the, of the island, not to block the signal on one side or uh, on the other side. Um, also, as it was mentioned, um, the, to, have, um, to optimize the coverage, the hydrophones, they need to be deployed 
uh, in a special layer underwater called the SOFAR channel, which I will explain in the next slide. Um, that's why we need long cables, tens of kilometers, sometimes hundreds of kilometers, in order to be able to deploy the triplet of hydrophones in that depth. The last station that was installed uh, was at Crozet Islands uh, in um, uh, South Indian Ocean, an extremely remote place, colony of uh, penguins and a few scientists living on those islands. But because we need to have a very wide a global geographical coverage, most of the stations are installed in very, very remote places. The degree of difficulty and risk is order of magnitudes higher than any other station in the network. And just to give you an idea of the assets and the complexity of a project, I would just uh, play a one minute um, video that um, uh, shows very briefly the, the Crozet, uh, summarizes the Crozet project. Can someone click on the... Thank you. Thank you. I have to say that uh, from this one minute video, of course, we excluded the scenes that you saw in the previous video because it was the same, the same part of the world, you know, because sometimes the weather pattern, uh, patterns are, are not uh, very friendly. Um, uh, so um, uh, this uh, um, has has to be taken in its um, best, best version, if you wish. So, um, a few things about the physics of sound propagation underwater. Um, the uh, sound travels with, with different uh, speed uh, in different depths underwater. On the left-hand side, you see um, a sound velocity profile that indicates the, the speed of sound for different depths. So at the beginning, we have the mixed layer, we have the seasonal layer and the seasonal thermocline. Then as the temperature decreases, so does the sound speed. And in the main thermocline, at the end of the main thermocline, we reach the minimum sound speed. After that, the temperature remains the same. That's why it's called deep isothermal layer. But the sound, the speed of sound keeps on increasing because of the hydrostatic pressure, of the weight of the water column that's um, above the minimum sound speed channel. So it is this minimum speed of sound that creates the famous SOFAR channel, which stands for sound fixing and ranging. Nature would like to preserve its energy, does not like to waste energy. So when sound waves depicted by rays in this cartoon, they travel to the uh, 
shallow water or deeper water from the minimum sound speed, they travel faster. They don't like that. And uh, according to Snell's law, they bend towards the minimum sound profile. So they keep on bending and they converging around the sofar channel. And that creates a waveguide that takes the acoustic energy really thousands of kilometers away. That's why uh, a lot of effort is taken into deploying the hydrophone triplets in the software channel when we install the uh, hydrophone hydroacoustic stations. The software channel was discovered during the Second World War and for some people uh, it is considered to be uh, the most important uh, discovery in communications after the radar. So it was, um, it, it was and it is used um, in many applications uh, regarding underwater acoustics. This is the coverage plot offered by the hydrophone stations that was shown before and the deep red colors are very close to the, uh, our stations. The colors become softer as we move away from the station and we have to account for propagation loss. But all in all, uh, when uh, fully operate, operational, the, the station or the hydroacoustic network covers the entire um, area of the, of the oceans. Now, the data from the, the stations, they are um, arriving in Vienna, they are processed, and here on the top part of the, of the slide, you can see various seismic events that are picked up and analyzed by uh, the analysts at um, uh, IDC. And also, since uh, there is, they listen 24-7 in the oceans, they pick up also all other kinds of signals. For example, you can see on the bottom part, you know, uh, whale chatter that um, um, uh, took place either near or far away from, from the hydrophones. Here is a, an example with an audio of uh, marine mammals very close to um, the um, Juan Fernandez station, which is, off, which is on the Robinson Crusoe, Crusoe Island um, of the um, Chile. Let's see if I can. can. So these uh, these signals have been artificially, uh, you know, accelerated so that the signal will be more audible because we can hear up to 20 hertz, and this can go lower than that. But and and this is uh, yet from another station, the the rumbling of 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 the earth after an earthquake in in Chile, and this is how it was picked up uh, by the hydrophones of the station. Somebody can help me with the... Okay. Also, the data uh, from our network are used in, in many civil applications. So the latest one was um, the analysis of signals from um, originated in, uh, in the vicinity of uh, the last known location of an Argentine submarine um, that uh, perhaps you saw in the news, who is missing since uh, 15th of November last year. Uh, the Argentine, uh, Argentina government thank us a lot for this for this assistance, and uh, that tells you that um, how useful byproducts uh, besides monitoring for signs of uh, nuclear explosion our system can uh, can provide. Uh, also, it should be noted that um, for the first time, uh, hydroacoustic network 
picked up um, uh, a signal that originated from the, uh, the last DBRK uh, nuclear test. Usually the seismic network, when it comes to underground tests, uh, the uh, seismic network is the one that uh, um, primarily pick up the signals, but this time uh, the uh, energy released was uh, um, uh, of, of an amount that allowed the, the signal to uh, travel all the way to uh, uh, hydrophone station and actually be uh, be detected automatically. So, what what do we do to sustain uh, this important network? We have periodic nearshore cable inspections. Um, the status of, of, uh, of the cable uh, is extremely important. There are risks for uh, anchor heats or different, um, you know, landslides or other uh, accidents that, that may happen. So um, we periodically, two to four years, we go inspect the, um, the near shore part of the cable. The same thing with the shore uh, facility it has to be up to date, state of the art, just like any other station. We uh, update nautical charts, we keep the pertinent authorities informed, we have marking buoys um, uh, to indicate uh, where the cable is and uh, um, help ships avoid uh, anchoring uh, nearby. We conduct periodic um, calibration to uh, make sure that the response of the underwater system electronics uh, are as they should be. And also, we do uh, also um, studies for the next generation of hydroacoustic stations. Um, the design of the current station is extremely robust um, and reliable, but it's 20 year old and um, it does not have any modularity, meaning that if a component underwater is broken, pretty much you have to replace the entire triplet. Uh, recent technology from the Ocean Observatory, uh, observatories um, showed that there is another way. You can have modular components which you can basically uh, replace underwater using underwater robots without having to replace the entire system. And that uh, certainly drives the sustainment cost of the hydroacoustic network down. Uh, we have a wealth of data that uh, they are available to, of course, the state signatories, the, uh, the National Data Center, but to the wider scientific community. Uh, a university, uh, an institute, a laboratory can contact uh, CTBTO and via a mechanism called VDEC, stands for Virtual Data Exploitation Center, they can sign a zero cost contract and they can uh, take data from, uh, from our network, uh, conduct uh, uh, their research, their studies. Um, the, the only thing that we request is basically that we, we are uh, mentioned and acknowledged uh, in, in, in the paper and, and that the work they do um, is preferably uh, um, relative to uh, the, uh, the work of the, of the Commission. And that's my final slide, the way forward. Um, as mentioned, we work for the next generation modular design IMS hydrophone stations. We have an ongoing project down selecting various options, uh, uh, preparing for development of a prototype and uh, eventually testing it at sea. Uh, it's a very harsh uh, environment. Uh, marine engineering is a very difficult and risky technology and everything has to be tested um, uh, before uh, exhaustively. Uh, the hydroacoustic component of the IMS is uh, fully certified. It's the first technology that certifies all its station, but it doesn't mean that every station that is certified cannot break down. And this is the case for the North Cable of Diego Garcia. Uh, one of our triplets is down since uh, 2014, 
and we are focusing all the efforts and resources into um, bringing the station back to life and uh, reinstalling the hydroacoustic ne network in its full capacity. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I would like to try to answer them. If not, we can move to the other technology and then I can take questions at the end if you wish. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Um, so in, uh, in this presentation, together with Stefka, we're going to talk in more detail about the seismic and infrasound monitoring technologies. Okay, so as you're well aware of by now, the International Monitoring System comprises 337 facilities based on four technologies. So, uh, George just, just talked about the hydroacoustic technology. Tomorrow, you will hear about the radionuclide technology. And now we're going to focus on the seismic technology with 170 stations and on the infrasound technology with 60 stations. And to start with, I will uh, introduce a few basic concept about how seismic and infrasound waves propagate within the Earth and within the atmosphere. So, uh, basically, when you have a sudden release of energy inside the Earth, there are several ways that energy will, uh, will uh, propagate. And uh, the first way is through compression. So, basically, you will have this release of energy that will push the particles, that will push the next particle, and basically you will have the energy going in the same direction as the compression. But there are also other ways. You have, for example, shear wave where the particle will go up and down, but the energy will go in that direction. You also have like a love wave where basically the particle, they will go in the right direction and left direction, but the energy will still go in that direction. You can think about it like a snake, for example, the body goes left and right, but the snake go in that direction. And finally, you have Rayleigh wave, where basically you will have this rotation of particles here, but still the energy will go in that direction. So what's important to, to know is that basically these two types of wave, P and S wave, they can propagate within the Earth, whereas these two types of wave, they can only propagate at the surface. And also, this surface wave, they propagate much slower than body waves here. Another very important concept to know is that this wave, they travel at different speed. So basically, the P wave that you see here, this is a cut of the Earth, this is the surface, this is the core. You see that this is the velocity. For example, the S wave in the mantle, they will travel at about 7 km per second, whereas the P wave, they will travel at 12 km per second. You can also see in this figure that S wave, they do not propagate inside the outer core because the outer core is liquid and the S wave, they can only propagate through sorry, solid media. So basically from that slide, before we move to the next slide, remember that there are different types of wave and that they all travel at different velocity and that S wave do not travel within the outer core. So now let's go to the next slide. So let's imagine you have uh, an earthquake at this location in California. This is the red triangle. And then you have all these black triangles, they are the seismic station, okay? And here you see on the side the signal that are recorded by all these seismic stations. So let's take a station, for example, like this station, uh, let's say this one here. So you see first from the explosion, I mean from the earthquake here, you will have the P and S wave that will travel along that path. And these are the waves that will arrive here. The P wave, they arrive first because we saw they are faster, and then you will have the S wave. But you will also have wave traveling at the surface like that, and these are the wave that you see here. And surface wave, you see them here, they have much higher amplitude, and this is why very often they are much more destructive uh, to the infrastructure, for example. Then now if you take another station, for example here, the other side of the wall, you see that the wave, they will have to travel through the outer core or through the inner core. And this is why you don't have S wave anymore. You only have P wave because you see that, as we said before, the, out, the S wave cannot travel through the outer core. So basically, the, the only thing I wanted to emphasize here is that one single event can generate multiple arrivals at the same seismic station. And now if you look at the 
time difference between these different arrivals. If you look also at these different type of signals, you have information about how far is the source, how deep is the source, and also what type of source it is. Is it an explosion? Is it an earthquake? So this is why at the same time the propagation is quite complex, but at the same time you get also a lot of information about the event from these uh, recorded signals. Now, the, the main source of earthquake is obviously the rupture of uh, geological fault. And this is the, a map with all the earthquake, or most of the earthquakes since uh, 19, uh, 1898. And you see that all these earthquakes, they are mainly along these uh, tectonic plates. And especially, you see very well this ring of fire here around the, the, Pacific, uh, the Pacific Ocean. So obviously, in our case, we are interested by explosion, but most of what we detect are these earthquake uh, along these uh, tectonic plates. Now we move to the infrasound to infrasound wave. So basically, the first thing is what's the difference between an infrasound, the sound, and ultrasound. In fact, they are all acoustic waves. And the only difference is whether you can hear it or you cannot hear it as a human. So if you can hear it, you call that sound. If the frequency is too low for you to hear it, you call it an infrasound. If the frequency is too high, so you cannot hear it, it's called ultrasound. And in the case of the CTBTO, we are mainly interested by this frequency band in the, in the infrasound uh, frequency band. So, and the frequency just corresponds to a number of oscillations per second. So when we say four hertz, for example, it means that in one second you have four oscillations. Same as in the Earth, you have several layers in the atmosphere. So you have, uh, and these layers, they are mainly defined uh, based on the, temp the profile of temperatures. You see this red curve here. So basically, when you go up here, the, the first layer is the troposphere. This is where you have most uh, atmospheric phenomena that you know, like rain, snow, clouds. And you see, you know very well, when you go at the top of the mountain, the temperature decreases. When you take the plane, temperature is even lower. So you see the temperature decrease. And then the temperature rise again because basically of the um, absorption of solar radiation by the ozone layer. Then temperature decrease again and again increase because here again you have molecular oxygen that is absorbing solar radiation. So basically what is important to know is that the propagation of infrasound wave, they will be really affected by the wind and by temperature. And this will change all the time in the atmosphere especially the wind. So whether in the case of seismic, the, the Earth's interior is very stable. In the case of infrasound, it will change all the time. So if you take, for example, the case of a meteor that exploded the offshore of Portugal near, nearby the, the Earth's surface last year, uh, you see that at this specific time, because of specific wind and temperature condition, this curve, they represent the propagation of infrasound. So for example, on the right side, you see in red, you had waves that were basically uh, uh, ref were refracted in the troposphere like that. But you had also reflection in the stratosphere in blue, and you had also reflection in the thermosphere in green. But for example, in the west direction, because there was, the wind was mainly blowing from west to east, you didn't have any reflection in that area of the atmosphere, only at very high altitude. And this will change every day, every season, every months it will change, that's why the propagation of infrasound is quite complex and you need to know your atmosphere very well if you want to go back on information on the source. So basically the main point here is that between the source and the station there will not be really a direct propagation. What we will observe will be after several bounces in the atmosphere. And then there is a number of infrasound sources, so as you can see here, man-made explosion, volcano, rocket launching, uh, meteors. So that's, uh, that's it with, uh, as, a, as an introduction of how wave propagates. And basically, what, if, you, if you remember one thing, remember that this propagation is quite complex. It's even more complex in the atmosphere than in the Earth. But at the end, thanks to this complexity, you get a lot of information about the medium and also about the, the source itself. Now we'll move to the IMS seismic and infrasound networks. So here again, we'll start with the primary seismic network. You see here, 88% of the network is certified. You see this station in green. And in the case of the auxiliary seismic uh, network, we have 89% uh, of the network certified. And in the case of the infrasound network, 
we have 83%. The, the main difference is that, as David explained earlier, these two, for these two networks, most of the stations, they existed before the, the, the treaty opened for signature. So basically, the stations were just upgraded, so they would meet the specification of the IMS. But in the case of the Infrasound network, none of these stations existed in 1998. So this network was built from scratch. You see two stations in light blue here that will be most probably certified this year, one in Antarctica and one in China. And there are other stations that are also uh, under construction. Uh, but also, as it was emphasized before, obviously there was a lot of station certified at the beginning of the at the beginning of the network, and now it's more and more difficult to build this uh, remaining station because of uh, different factors. Okay, just a small again, uh, maybe uh, animation about how these stations are working. So what's important to know is that most of the infrasound or seismic station, in fact, they are composed of several measurement systems. So in, this is one single station, and you have several points that are within a few kilometer diameter area that record the signal, okay? And all this uh, data is sent, as it was explained, in near real time to the international data center through the global communication infrastructure. You see this wave that arrived, this element, they record the wave one after another, and then you see this signal which is transmitted to the IDC. Um, and then the data arrive in the IDC, and then it will be processed first automatically, and then there will be a review by analysts. So how does it work? There will be a dedicated presentation to this, I think, about this tomorrow. So I will just uh, briefly explain you how it works. So first of all, the first data that we will process is the data from the primary and hydroacoustic station, because basically these waves, they propagate much faster than, uh, than uh, infrasound wave, for example. So First of all, you will have information about an event through these two technologies. And as you, if you remember this, uh, this slide with the, with the earth and the signal, basically, so first we'll try for each of the stations to identify which, uh, what is each of these signal and what do they correspond to, station per station. And then you will try to combine all these signal that you have detected at all these stations to, to form uh, an event, to come back to information about an event. And which means that the automatic system, just one hour after real time already, will be able to identify a preliminary list of events based on data from these two technologies. But after that, slowly, slowly, we will incorporate also data from other technology. And already four hours after uh, real time, you will have uh, already data from the auxiliary seismic and infrasound network that will be incorporated. And six hours after uh, near real time, you will have the final uh, event list, which is, will be ready to, uh, to be reviewed by the analyst. And then, so the analyst, they will start looking at this data, try to identify maybe false uh, detection, false association, and they will publish two days after what we call a reviewed event built-in. And then this built-in will be automatically screened out to distinguish, uh, let's say, natural event from uh, more explosive events. This will be done almost interna uh, instantaneously by, uh, by the system. So it means two days after, you will have this final product, which is called standard screen event built-in. And uh, as it was said before, basically all these data, as well as all these event list and built-ins, they are available to state signatories. So now the, the main thing that we are looking for, uh, obviously, is to detect, uh, to detect nuclear explosion. And you see here on this map the location of the sixth last nuclear explosion, the circles that you see here, they correspond to uh, error ellipse. And basically, you can see that with time, the error ellipse is smaller and smaller, mainly because we get more and more stations. So uh, as we get more and more stations, we are sure and sure about the, the location of the, of the event. So this is information about the last event that occurred uh, last year. And basically, in the case of that event, you can see that it was detected by 134 stations. So that's a big number. All the primary seismic station, most of the auxiliary seismic station, two hydroacoustic station, and one infrasound station. But obviously, most of the time, we don't detect nuclear explosion. Most of the time, what we detect, as we said before, are these earthquakes that are produced by this uh, rupture of ge geological faults. So since 2000, we have more than 500,000 events that were detected by, this, uh, by our system. And as you can think, there, this is why there are a number 
of uh, scientific and civil application that use this data uh, apart from, uh, from uh, nuclear monitoring. We'll just give again a few examples here because I think there will be a dedicated presentation tomorrow. But in the case of the seismic technology, you know that uh, large earthquakes, they can generate tsunami. And this is why basically we share our data also in near real time with the 14 tsunami warning sensor centers. In the case of the infrasound technology, uh, this data is also uh, interesting for the civil aviation because you see we can detect volcano eruption and some of them they generate these ash plumes. And these ash plumes, they can really damage uh, the reactors of the airplanes. So this is why it's important for the civil aviation to know when there are potential volcanic eruption. We also monitor, here you see this, uh, this object that entered the atmosphere. It's a very good system in complement from satellite system to get uh, uh, information about the location of this uh, object entering the atmosphere and also some uh, interesting information about the, dynamic of the dynamics of the middle atmosphere. So now I will give the floor to Steffi that will uh, talk in more detail about seismic and infrasound stations. Okay, so now seismic and infrasound stations of the global monitoring system. To listen to the sound and also to detect the ground movement, we need special sensors to do that. So at each station, um, that you have seen, we have a large number of sensors deployed, specialized sensors, very high sensitive sensors, which for seismic are called seismometers. We have different models for different purposes. We have a sensor installed on the surface, sensor installed in boreholes, which are displayed in the first line. And also the pictures, we have um, one of those in the vault, one surface sensor, and one, the bottom picture, one in the borehole. Uh, the reason to have both of them is a compromise between data quality and cost of the installation. Uh, we are looking for very stable locations so that the sensor is stabilized and does not record noise, the movement, which is not a signal that we are interested in. To do that, it's nice to install the sensor underground in the borehole. However, to make the borehole, to drill the borehole, it's extremely expensive. Sometimes we have to go down to 100 meters. The idea is to reach a, a solid ground, the bedrock, uh, to avoid the sedimentary basins where the movement, so the noise will be much higher. So those deep boreholes, also they're expensive, timely consumed and uh, the surface sensor are the alternative to that. Uh, for the infrasound, since, uh, infrasound stations, we have sensors called microbarometers. Those are very high sensitive barometers which are going to register very small amplitude uh, of um, sound changes in, uh, changes in, the, in the atmospheric pressure which is the sound. Uh, the main enemy for the infrasound is the uh, wind noise. We cannot uh, install those uh, sensors otherwise than on the surface. But to reduce the wind noise, we have to have some uh, ways to, uh, to reduce the wind noise, which sometimes can hide the very low amplitude sound that we are interested in. So that's um, there, this installation on the bottom uh, picture you see on the green grass, these pipes installed in a certain configuration and the, the idea is to filter as much as possible the wind noise. Very uh, important is that for both seismic and infrasound sensors, because we are interested in a certain frequency range, those sensors have to be stable and um, to provide reliable data in that frequency range which is of interest of the CTBT which is uh, marked just nearby the, the, um, the title for, for seismic. We have 2.02 hertz to 16 hertz and infrasound it's up to 4 hertz signal that we are interested in. So at one station we might have and we do have more than one sensor 
they are installed in different configurations. I don't know how well we can see the dots in this uh, in this slide on distance. I barely see just the ones in front of me. But uh, those are seismic arrays. And as it was said already before, the seismic stations, they existed prior to the CTBT. So the configuration is the one that the countries have had uh, by the time of installation, different configurations uh, reflect different interest. Uh, sometimes, uh, initially, the stations were built to monitor regional events or uh, events along certain uh, axes. So that's why you see different configuration on this slide. Each dot is one sensor. Uh, so the larger um, uh, circles is above 20 kilometers diameter, and then you have really small arrays, depending on that initial interest. There is no uh, really uh, requirements for the IMS stations, uh, which one is better or we want to use, use uh, simply that uh, installation that already existed at those seismic stations. In contrast, for the infrasound stations that non-existed by the time of installation, uh, the array geometry was calculated and specially designed for to optimize the detection by the infrasound stations. So that you see um, they are much more homogeneous, no more than two kilometers in uh, diameter in the aperture, and uh, the deployment in different configurations between four and 15 elements at each, stations, at each station. So uh, this, you have seen uh, briefly the process of the establishment of the stations, starting with the facility agreement. Uh, actually, the facility agreement is after the treaty. If you open the treaty, uh, you have the stations already fixed with their locations, with their coordinates. You can see in the annexes of the treaty the exact coordinates. But then facility agreement has to be signed between the preparatory commission and the host country uh, to allow and to give details of how and when and uh, what will be the support that the host country will provide to the uh, PTS for the installation. And to answer um, uh, the question why sometimes it may have um, it may uh, represent a long process to do that is because the facility agreement has to be uh, ratified by the host country uh, authorities, which can be the parliament or senate or whatever the host country authority is. So this ratification, which is a political um, action, may take time. You know, they have sessions, they have different debates. That's why uh, it may take time sometimes. So after the facility agreement is in place, the station can, um, the process of building the station can start. And it starts with a site survey, which is one of the most important steps because even the station has already its, uh, its, its coordinate fixed in the treaty. Doesn't mean to say that exactly this location is the most um, uh, is the best location for that station. We have to stick to that uh, location in the treaty, but we have to find the best um, the best location in terms of noise, in terms of uh, detection capability. No more than 0 0.1 degrees, however, can be the variation around this uh, treaty degrees, which is more or less 100 kilometers or less depending where it is, uh, so that uh, teams from the PTS are going to the station before, of course, having the station, but going to the coordinates and trying to make measurements and trying to find the best location for it. Again, for seismic, we do have the stations already, the majority of them. Uh, for infrasound, for each station, site survey was the first step with uh, days and sometimes weeks of measurements and different locations in terms of determining the best location in terms of uh, wind noise. Uh, also by the time of site survey uh, we have to define if even the location is good 
we can build a station in this land, it can be a national park, it can be a private property. So discussions are made, that's where the, also the host country can interfere and facilitate the, the establishment of the station and to the definition of the points. So once the points, exact locations are defined for each element of the array, we can start the construction and the establishment of the station. So the next step will be the civil work. It's a long process, it's a construction. You have seen there, there are civil works, uh, you have access roads, uh, we have uh, all the installations to be built, to be constructed. As much as possible, uh, local companies are doing that. Of course, it's a bidding process and we try to involve as much as possible local construction uh, and civil work companies to do that as well as the future station operator. Also with the equipment installation, which is the ne next step when people from the commission go to the site and install the equipment together with the station operator as much as possible because that's the most valuable time to work together with the station operators to train them so that they can support and um, maintain and operate the station uh, when uh, the station is certified. Once the equipment is installed, of course, it's tested so that we know it is working as we expect. And the certification is the last step when all the equipment is um, again screened and all the responses are tested and uh, analyzed so that we know that the installed equipment is within the uh, requirement and um, the data that the station will provide are conform with the expectations. Uh, just two examples of the last installation of the seismic stations. Those are the two uh, seismic stations in China, which have been certified in December last year. So we have um, borehole installations and sur surface installation uh, seismic uh, stations PS12 and PS13 in China. I don't know how visible are those pictures. And uh, last installed, not yet certified infrasound station is ISO3 in Australia. Is the Antarctic uh, territory, uh, Australian Antarctic base. So it's a seven element uh, station with uh, very difficult conditions during the site survey, not really. Uh, good conditions for the infrasound, but what, that's what we have. Uh, the, seven, the seven elements, they have been deployed in the optimal configuration for the detection capabilities and the challenge, of course, have been the logistics, how to transfer the data, uh, the equipment there, and how to install a boat and helicopters um, or used for the installation. So this station is yet to be uh, certified. So, so when, once the stations are installed, we have to have data available and good quality. And how we do that, Julian will continue that presentation. Thanks. So exactly. Uh, it's, uh, we have this beautiful station, but then you need to, have in, to ensure that you have data and good quality data. And so these are three last slides before the coffee break. So we'll try to go uh, quickly through them. But the, you see in this figure the data availability for the, for the primary seismic in dark blue, uh, purple auxiliary seismic, and light blue infrasound. The target is 98%. You see we are almost there with the infrasound network. There's still a little bit of work to do for the primary and auxiliary seismic network. And the main way to achieve that is, the, is basically the station operator. So for at each of the station, the, for each of the station, the host country appoint a station operator. And uh, everywhere where you have a, a skillful uh, sta station operator who's responsive and proactive, you, you can be sure, almost sure, that you will have very high data availability. But, and this is why the organization put a lot of emphasis on training and capacity building for, for station operators. But obviously, in the first place, station must also be designed to be as robust as possible. And Steffi showed this uh, picture of station in Antarctica that needs to work unmanned for several years. So this is why it's important to have this robust design 
which is done through, for example, ensuring that the data is stored at different locations at the station. So even if you have uh, a break in communication, data can be retransmitted afterwards, making sure you have the right amount of spare at the station, making sure as well that all the equipment is uh, thoroughly uh, tested before installation. And another aspect is that some of these stations, they were installed more than 20 years ago, and uh, this is why they, we need to also be very careful at uh, equipment obsolescence and aging also of the infrastructure and make sure that we upgrade this station in time to protect this uh, investment that has been made at these stations. So, for example, in 2017, we had a complete upgrade of a station in the Pacific, the upgrade of two size small acoustic array in Russian Federation, one station in Ascension Island, one station in Hawaii, one station, two stations in Papua New Guinea, and one station in, uh, in Kazakhstan. And finally, this is the last slide, so about quality assurance. So quality assurance is all about uh, uh, why can we trust our data? And I think this is really important. Why can member states trust our data? How can they be confident that what we detect is, uh, is real? And, uh, and basically, there are, there are four processes that are defined uh, for, uh, to support this objective in our operational manual. The first process is the type approval process, which means that before you even consider using a certain type of equipment through the network, you will first make extended testing on that piece of equipment, just to say, okay, that type of equipment, we can use it in the future. And then the second step is acceptance testing. So then the manufacturer will produce this equipment and each individual piece of equipment will be again tested solely against the specification. And after that, so you see in these two first steps, we were testing each of the components. And in the third step, we are already on site at the station. We assemble all these components together. Now we are talking about a system and now we'll test the system at the station in operational condition and we'll make sure that once again it meets, it meets our specification. And then on a yearly basis, we will check again the response of that system and compare it against the result that we got at the time of installation. And if this result, they are not compliant, then we will replace the equipment and we'll again perform this step, which is the initial calibration. So with, uh, with that last slide, I would like just to thank you for your attention. Yeah, and open the floor for questions. If it... Thank you very much for your presentations. I'm Stephen Herzog from the United States. I have a quick question about um, array seismology, and that is when I was looking up uh, at the slides and you were talking about uh, the use of previously existing seismic arrays for the IMS, you noted that there are really no specific requirements and array geometry is, is generally uh, is, is, is quite different. And so my question is, um, and this may be just variable depending upon uh, station construction, is what is the optimal kind of ratio in configuration of broadband versus short period seismometers for the type of events that the PTS is interested in? Or is there just not really one or no specific, you know, idea about that? Thanks very much. Thank you for your question. It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, in fact, there is just one minor requirement about uh, array geometry for seismic array, is that the array must have at least nine short period elements and one broadband element. So that's the requirement from the operational manual. And if you, uh, maybe if you can put back the slides. Yeah. And uh, so it's correct that most of the array, they were installed already, but some of them, they were not, and okay we will see maybe later, that then we came up with a kind of uh, uh, roughly optimal configuration for, uh, for these new arrays, which would look like, for example, the configuration we have in China for these two arrays that did not exist before the, 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 the treaty opened for signature. So you see this nine element configuration. So usually you have one broadband at the center and all the other one, they are short period. And uh, the concept behind that is that uh, basically most of the information is given by the short period. We expect that most of the, the information, okay. 
is it even correct sorry but it's uh, somehow uh, somehow you use the short period in, uh, element to improve your signal to noise ratio especially for the for the as what we saw in the at the beginning of the presentation for p and s wave whether the the lower part of the spectra is more focused on surface wave you saw that are much lower frequency and usually we look at this wave with the broadband element but on top of that the broadband element usually is a three component sensor so you measure motion in three direction so both horizontally in both direction and vertically which means that you also get information again about the distance of the event and the, the type of event that it is so this is with these two combination of uh, sensors that you, you you maximize information on the on your source i hope it answers your your question Thank you for your presentations. I would like to raise a question for the two first speakers. Um, why there are only 11 hydroacoustic stations all over the world? So is that enough? Because I saw on the maps that you showed in the slides that uh, in the South China Sea, there's no hydroacoustic stations. Thanks. Yeah, is it possible to bring the map with the hydroacoustic stations? Okay, um, this map, um, okay, let, let's uh, first answer the, the question regarding the, the number of stations. We have few hydroacoustic stations because the acoustic energy propagates so efficiently underwater, it's completely different from the atmosphere or even the earth, that it can travel almost halfway around the world and still communicate and transmit the signal. This is, it is really, really incredible. You can go from South Australia to Boston and you can, you know, you have uh, really signals picked up at this kind of distances. So what you see here is basically a simulation of uh, the coverage offered in the entire on the entire you know um, area of the of the oceans only with our six hydro hydrophone stations on the top of that you have to put also the TFA stations so that's that's one part now um, regarding the actual location of the stations um, no, I'm going the other way so uh, here um, you, you can see that, um, okay, we can have, uh, we have a hydrophone station uh, on the west coast of Australia, Cape Lewin, and then on the, on the other side, on the, uh, on the Pacific, we have uh, the North uh, Wake Island hydrophone station, 
and then look to the left of your of the picture where uh, for the south part of the of the Pacific we have the Robinson Crusoe HO3 station. So believe me that they offer complete coverage and complementary coverage actually uh, in in this part of the world. We have uh, we pick up signals. 15,000 kilometers away, you know, something, a signal that uh, generated off the coast of Japan can be picked up um, from the station in, in Chile. Um, this is uh, quite incredible. I, I realize it's kind of difficult to believe how much acoustical coverage it's offered by few, few stations. But because of the software channel, because of the mechanism of the um, energy being trapped in that horizontal layer underneath the surface, it can really travel uh, long distances uh, without energy dissipation. Does this answer your um, your question? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Inzi Kim from South Korea. I have a question about the accuracy or precision differences among technologies. Uh, I wonder whether the CTBT trusts a certain type of technology more than others. Also, I wonder that how many measures or technologies are used before you, the CTBTO concludes that there is a nuclear test. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, as, as a parent, if someone said, which one of my children did I like better? I'd say I like them all. And I think with our stations and our technologies, these are uh, things that are prescribed to us. So um, we uh, do not have, I think, the luxury of choosing amongst these. So I think uh, you, you approach this as, uh, you know, we, we strive as, as staff to complete each of the segments of the networks based on these technologies. And um, I think what we've seen, though, in, in the history of using the network to monitor the uh, sporadic tests that have happened over the 20 years, we've noted that each one has been an opportunity to see which part of the network uh, worked to help us uh, detect and then confirm uh, the various uh, declared test events. So uh, I think I, my answer is I'd be agnostic on that, and so I won't offer a, uh, a favorite technology, but just say that amongst the technologies we have established, the hydro segment, but all of the others are coming very, very close, and I think the maturity of all of the monitoring technologies is one of the remarkable achievements. And I think so far we've uh, uh, our most recent, looking at the last uh, you know, 10 plus years since 2006, we've seen uh, really good increases in the capabilities of the networks uh, and all segments of the network to participate in that. And, and that includes also the, the staff here, the communication system. So these have been uh, excellent testing events for us as well as an organization and as to see how well of our, our system uh, has performed. So I hope that answers. Uh, my question is for Julien. The propagation of the infrasound waves is mainly driven by wind and temperature. I want to know how do you install the, the, infra, the infra, in, infrasound stations in regions with many direction wind perturbations? So, there are, first of all, it's a very good question, and I think there are two sides to this question. So, first of all, is uh, the fact that if you have a lot of wind at the station, it will create a lot of pressure fluctuation, and then you will not see the pressure fluctuation coming by this, uh, produced by this wave that will come very, from very far. So basically, you need to try to reduce as much as possible this 
pressure fluctuation produced by wind. And uh, there are several ways to achieve that, but the first way is to try to build it in the place when there is no wind, for example, inside a dense forest. And also, you saw maybe on the slides, we use this kind of uh, network of pipes that is called a wind noise reduction system that will try to average this pressure fluctuation produced by wind turbulence. So this is at the station. But then there is the other side where we cannot do anything. It means in altitude, the wind and temperature will change. And because of this change, sometimes the wave, they will be reflected at certain altitude in certain direction. And this, we have absolutely uh, no way to change that. So we just have to uh, try to understand it, to have a lot of information about how the atmosphere is in uh, near real time. And this way, we can try to to, uh, to understand how the signal propagated from the source to the stations. I hope it answers your, your question. I think we're going to have to uh, leave it there. Sorry if I've uh, stopped any final questions coming through, but you're all here for most of the next two weeks, so if there are any further questions you have on waveform monitoring technologies, we're happy to gather them up and to direct them to the right person. Uh, so join me now, please, in thanking uh, David, uh, first of all, and uh, the whole team here um, for the presentations that they've given you in the last hour, hour and a half. We have uh, time for a short break. We're going to resume at 5 p.m. There is some tea and coffee available, but please do try to be back on time so we can finish in a timely manner. Thank you.
general confirmation of you know in the
Okay, thank you, uh, participants, for making your way back uh, to your seats. We're going to move into the final session of today, which is uh, following on from the afternoon session on waveform monitoring technologies. We're now going to delve into waveform data processing and analysis with uh, Ivan Kitov, who's the seismic acoustic officer here at the CDPTO. So uh, I give the floor to you, Ivan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivan Kitov, as represented already, and I will talk about, oh, not yet, uh, the waveform processing and analysis. So this is a big, big issue at the CTBTO, which uh, uh, includes the data from all IMS stations, is to close. Oh, it uh, includes the processing of data from all IMS data, uh, stations and production of uh, bulletins which we distribute among the state's parties. So our, I will talk about the automatic processing pipeline. The, so it's two. Okay, this. It's on. Okay. Uh, I will talk about automatic processing pipeline which describes the, uh, schematically the processing, mainly about seismic processing, hydroacoustic processing, and infrasound processing, which are three waveform technologies we have here. Then uh, a few, one slide about interactive analysis, because you will have uh, uh, 
presentation from analysts post-processing and data fusion. Uh, first of all, this is the pipeline. It includes uh, all technologies, but we, we are talking about seismic, hydroacoustic, and infrasound. Hyd uh, seismic is split into different sets of stations. The first is primary stations. They are supposed to be 50, and auxiliary stations, which are 120, but not all of them ready yet, you, you know from the, pre the previous presentations. Hydroacoustic and infrasound, it's a game. So, okay, change on the fly. Um, the data are processed in a few stages, which are related to different stations and different technologies. And the, on the way, there are a few products that, uh, produced. Uh, which is uh, standard event list one, standard event list two, standard event list three. These are automatic products. So automatic processing produces that bulletins, event lists. Then it, they, it goes to analysts and they review the automatic bulletin and improve it, reject some events, add some new events, make that product uh, most precise. And that it, it goes for post-processing, which includes mostly many different processes, but most important for us is event screening. So we split, we distinguish between natural events and events which are, may not be natural. They are not nuclear tests, but we don't know what are the events. They are not fully uh, with a high probability natural. So we have some doubts and we keep them for the countries to decide what to do with them. Uh, the processing starts with a uh, station. So the data come here and we start station by station process them. There are two general processes, processes which we uh, use here. First is data, DFX, which is date detection and feature extraction. And second is station processing. What does it mean DFX? So we try to find all detections at all three uh, waveform technologies, seismic, infrasound, and hydroacoustic, and for formulate a list of the detections with the characteristics of the detections. And Pro helps us to uh, name the phases, if it's possible by the characteristics of that phases. So quite a few different characteristics is calculated during that to process it at stations. And uh, most important for detection is signal to noise ratio, which means that uh, the part of the waveform has some energy which is bigger than other parts. I mean, we see that, uh, that this is above the, some threshold and we call that signal because it is different from everything else before and after. And signal to noise ratio is one of the important things here. So this is a typical waveform at station Jurass. This is an array station. It means it has quite a few uh, sensors which are distributed over the uh, surface and they record, they measure the motion of the ground and the distance between them, a few hundred meters and the aperture of that array is approximately four kilometers. So the distance between sensors which detect uh, the signals, the seismic signals, uh, may have uh, the value of four kilometers and if we have kind of a wave which is traveling with a velocity of four kilometers per second, it may arrive at two different uh, uh, Here we have quite a few potential signals. You see some in increase in amplitude can be considered uh, uh, like uh, a signal. We don't know yet, but this is potential. So I put some errors, errors uh, to say it's potential signals, and we have to decide, is it a signal which is relevant to our 
processing or not. And uh, to decide on that, we uh, have a procedure which uh, is based on uh, iterative uh, investigation of the uh, waveform uh, structure and waveform qualities. First of all, we uh, check quality uh, inside the detection and feature extraction uh, process. When we improve our signal to noise ratio, when we find detec detection with detector, and when we define a detector and calculate some parameters for that. So the GRS uh, station is an array. It means it has some sensors. And the uh, beauty of the array is that it increases the signal to noise ratio. Uh, it's a very simple uh, physical phenomena when you gather energy from different parts uh, of uh, the surface together with time delays which are related to the signal arrival to that station and you improve your signal to noise ratio theoretically by the square root of the number of stations. So if you have 15, oh, okay, if you have 16 stations, uh, theoretically the signal uh, to noise ratio will be improved by a factor of four if you use uh, the array of 16 stations. And also uh, the array uh, station allowed to estimate the uh, direction from which the signal arrives and the velocity along the surface for that uh, signal. And uh, it's described here, but uh, details are uh, not for this time, maybe. So after we used uh, different summation of the signals with different type delays of the station, we finally get the best beam and see how the signal is improved here. And it's the only signal now which deserves to be saved because this is the uh, signal with a higher SNR and everything else which I mentioned before disappeared because it was noise. It was not supported by, by all channels. So this is the detection which when uh, this is the waveform which then go, goes to detection and we use the standard uh, detector which is based on short-term average and long-term average amplitude. So it means we consider that signals are short and the noise is the same, it doesn't change over long periods of time and if it take, sorry, 60 seconds of long-term average and move it and one second or 0.5 seconds of the short-term average, we will see that the previous uh, figure gives us very nice uh, uh, understanding that the signal, which is very short here, will have very large amplitude and the noise, which is 60 he seconds here, will be very low amplitude and we will see detection. And uh, we use STA-LT detector with different thresholds. What has been threshold? If the uh, STA to LT ratio is above some value, which is station dependent and frequency dependent, when we say, okay, this is the detection, and we write it into the database as a detection, and when we determine parameters of that detection for further processing. Uh, arrays, as I already mentioned, allow us to uh, find where the, what is the azimuth and uh, velocity of the wave. So where the signal comes from, it's very easy to uh, explain if I switch off. Who will hear that first? Myself, because I am the closest one, yeah? So when the first row, second row, third row, and so on, and the time delay between the arrivals of my noise, or my signal, will be proportional to the distance, divided by the velocity, yeah? this is the definition, velocity is 320 meters per second. So if you have a clock very precise and detect that signal, you will see that the first row will have one time and the other 
roles will be later detecting the same signal. So uh, the direction is easy to uh, calculate because we know the sequence of uh, detections. If I move a, a different corner of that room and clap hand, hands where, the pattern will be different, yeah? The first to hear my signal would be the person closest to the room, and the, this end of the room would be the last one. So the array does exactly the same. So the sensors are over the surface, and if the wave comes from this direction to the first sensor, and to the second, and so on, and we see the time delays between our sensors, and we say, okay, this comes from this direction, but if the sequence of detections is different, we know the direction where the wave comes from. And also, if we know delays between sensors and distance, time delays between sensors and distance, we know the velocity along uh, the array. And that's all the technology, all the processing which array does physically. So it just tries to interpret the arrival times at the detections uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, azimuth and slowness. Slowness is inverse velocity, so velocity and azimuth of a signal. And here, uh, we show that for this specific signal which I presented before, the, it came from, I would say, uh, northeast a bit and had velocity of approximately 15 kilometers per second, because I know the sequence on the array. Uh, now we know the detection time, uh, arrival time, now we know the azimuth, the slowness of the wave coming to us, and you know that most of our primary stations are array stations, which is a nice feature of our IMS network. Now we would like to interpret them uh, together, because one station does not give you the correct result, where the source of uh, that signal is, and uh, what is the size of this source. So one station is not easy to uh, use to get very accurate location and magnitude estimate of the signal. What we have to do? We have to process together signals at different stations, and that is called network processing, because our stations all together is, are called network. The network of seismic stations, the network of hydroacoustic stations, and the network of infrasound stations. We also have a network of radionuclide stations, but these are not waveform technologies. So we have signals, which are here on time plot, and these are the same signals, yeah. This and this, this and this, which are detected at different stations. Uh, these stations are, are Matsushira in Japan, Makanchi in Russia, oh, Kazakhstan. Arkes, it's Norway, and Ulm, it should be Canada, I think. So, how can we get uh, the source from the arrival times, azimuth, from these detections? Can we project the times back to some source and say, okay, this is the signals, these are the signals which belong to the same source. Uh, to do this, we use uh, uh, almost the same technology which I described with uh, clapping my hand. Now imagine that I am in the center of the audience yeah, and clap my hand. So now this is not a ray anymore because I am inside the array, which is called now network, and people around me will also get the uh, times of the signal, the closest, then the next row, and depending on the distance, it's later, later, and later. It's the same with uh, waveform technologies. We have a source, we have a network, which is our array, and we see how different stations with, mm, signals arrive from uh, the some potential source. Uh, we don't know where the source is to begin with, yeah? So what we can do, I can move 
each position on the floor and clap hands and uh, measure the travel time or time detection for each my position at each of your position. And then uh, if I move to a known position and clap my hands, we can say from the picture of the arrivals, where am I? Because I, I was already where, yeah? So this is a grid search. So we know travel times from all points on the Earth. Yeah? If we have a source somewhere, we know how the stations are. And that's why we use the grids, the grid uh, which covers the whole globe to see it in event. So in each of the circles of the uh, three degrees in radius is used as a potential position of the source. And for that potential position, we calculate if the source is where, what would be the arrival times at all our stations, if any, because the signal can be too small to be detected, then some stations do not detect it, or it's possible that in some range between 100 degrees and 120 degrees approximately, there is no wave arriving because of the uh, core uh, kind of uh, make a shadow zone. It's no way, no waves coming through uh, in these distances. Here we show the grid on the surface, and this is the grid and the depth of 240 kilometers because we want to cover with the grid the whole globe where the events can be, and we know that the deepest event can be at the depth of 700 kilometers. We cannot locate any event below that depth. 700 is our limit. Uh, the lower mantle starts where, so we think that in the lower mantle there is no uh, seismicity. Uh, here is a scheme how the process goes one by one. It's a long scheme. I will not put too much effort to explain it because behind the, each of these boxes a lot of uh, experience, a lot of uh, relationships, a lot of uh, studies. So, but uh, what we have to know that there are two uh, principal things. This is global association. So when we try to associate the detections with one source somewhere, and if the uh, detections come together to one source, we say they are associated. Yeah? But sometimes it happens that some detections can be associated with few events, two, three events. What to do then? It may happen during the aftershock sequence like Tahoku, where we have hundreds of events per hour, and we don't know which event is responsible for that detection. So uh, to do that, there is a special processing scheme which is called uh, global association conflict. So it, it is also the conflicts between the events which pretend to the same detection. Usually the event which is bigger wins the game, so because it's bigger. So uh, step by step, resolve the uh, associating phases and resolve the con all the conflicts, we get the first bulletin, which is uh, standard event list one. It comes approximately in one hour after the end of the data. So the data are processed every 10 minutes. So 10 minutes are processed to the next 10 minutes, to the next 10 minutes, and so on. And after the end of the, that 10 minutes, in an hour, we get a first bulletin, which is standard event list one. Uh, to get to that list, the event hypothesis has to have weight, you know, to, to be representative to move into the list. What does it mean, weight? It, it is the sum of the properties, which is if it has arrival time within specific limits, it has the value one. The azimuth, 0.4, it's for primary seismic arrays. And slow one is 0.4. So one station can add 1.8, yeah? Two array stations, can give 3.6 if they have good 
arrival times, azimuth estimates, and slowness estimate. So it's easy to say that the weight uh, which is needed for a hypothesis to go to the uh, SEL1 is 3.55, because, I mean, it's two stations. And it's only about seismic stations. I don't consider here the infrasound station and hydroacoustic station. They are processed a bit a different way, and uh, they can add also to build an event which consists of hydroacoustic and seismic, hydroacoustic and infrasound, whatever. But uh, this is for the weights for seismic waves. Uh, but we also have some three component stations, not all our stations arrays. So they also have very good uh, arrival time weight of one, but for, they are not very good to define the azimuth and slowness or the velocity of the wave because it has no array. So there is no time delays between channels and the estimate is a bit poor. So we don't give that good weight. So it's one primary array and one primary three component station does not make an event. So we need at least three uh, stations then. And so on. This is for automatic processing for all uh, three stages of automatic processing, which are the SEL1, SEL2, and SEL3. For in, uh, interactive analysis, uh, it's a different. So we need to move to the final uh, product of our uh, organization, very reliable events. So weight here is 4.6. It means at least three primary stations are, have to be in the solution, in the location of that event. And this is the difference. You will get the uh, presentation from analysts how they produce the uh, uh, interactive analysis and we will discuss more with you. So this is how the network processing works. So back to the uh, pipeline. So we are somewhere here. Yeah? It's one hour. Uh, the second list comes in four hours after the end of the data segment. And the third one in six hours. And this is standard event list three is the final automatic product. After that, analysts come and uh, review the bulletin cell free, adding phases, removing phases, adding events, removing events, making the sense of uh, learning from years and years of experience to give the best product. Uh, why four, why one hour, four hours, and six hours? Why it is kind of why it's not 30 minutes, uh, one hour and one and a half hour. Uh, it's because uh, the data processing is in GA is uh, constructed in 20 minutes intervals. And this is uh, defines the possibility to create an event from the phases which are detected right now. So the source may be one hour before or 30 minutes before, but at some stations we see that signal only now. You know, the, some stars give us light which is five billion years old. Here we don't have five billion years old light, but we have 30 minutes old signals, which belong to the uh, event which happened 30 minutes ago, if it's other side of Earth. So for seismic wave, which are processed, uh, seismic primary stations, which are processed in the beginning for SAL1, we have a uh, processed interval, the interval which belongs to the previous processing, plus 20 minutes ahead. So this is the interval where we are looking for the events which are, have signals within one hour before that. So this is the 
first product which we can give because the latest phases come right now. So it's not one hour, it's less, but anyway, the processing takes some time, the interval wait 20 minutes, so we have to wait before starting the interval 20 minutes. So we get that, and the next one starts in 20 minutes. So one hour is the shortest time we can produce the cell one. Uh, after cell one, uh, we have some uh, event hypothesis, and we want to corroborate them because they are based only on uh, primary stations. And we have 120 auxiliary seismic stations, and we request waveforms from that stations based on the events we built in cell one. We request, send, we send the request, and we get data which have some time delay to retrieve, to get that here, to process. So altogether, including uh, of auxiliary data, takes more time to process, but we get the SEL2, which is much better than SEL1. Also, at that stage, we now have uh, infrasound stations. You know that infrasound, it's approximately uh, three seconds per one kilometer. Yeah? If the station is uh, 2,000 kilometers far, it's, okay, 6,000 seconds or uh, 100 minutes, one hour and a half, yeah, approximately. So we are not too much fast. Uh, and before we see, but my, much older than seismic waves and the oldest for our technology. So some uh, detections from remote infrasound stations might be in few hours after this event itself, but event might be nuclear test. So it's important to have that data processed. We do not wait the furthest stations, but we already can use the closest infrasound stations because, because you know, they cover the whole globe with the distance of a few thousand kilometers between them. And finally, uh, the infrasound stations are latest uh, come one by one, and we don't wait to the, the longest uh, infrasound station. But because we have to produce a voting for the state's parties, which should uh, have some information about the potential violation of the treaty, uh, and we issue the uh, final voting in six hours. So after that, data can come uh, still from different stations, may, maybe some delays in communication and so on. But this is already for the analysts to include that data in processing. So they have to, to do that themselves, not the, in automatic processing. So, and here we have approximate uh, time windows for uh, the processing. For seismic, it's 20 minutes, for, but not one, more than one hour. So for hydroacoustic, as you know already from the previous talk, so that's uh, 10 or 15,000 kilometers and we have 1.5 kilometer per second, we can get uh, detection from very small event. So we have to include that in processing as well. And for infrasound, we process approximately 17 or 18 hours. So the station may give you signal after 17 hours of, after the event, because it's very slow. Uh, summarizing the automatic processing, I have to stress the differences between the automatic, which is, uh, of course, has some limitations based on the absence of flexibility in the changing of the parameters which we use for processing. We have a set of parameters, and they are forever. So we can change, but it's not on the fly. We have to introduce new parameters if we see that it's important, but it's not often. Uh, in interactive analysis, of course, the uh, analyst can use fancy tools to improve what automatic processing missed. 
And, uh, but to analysts, we have, oh, sorry. To analysts, to their products, we have quite strong requirement of building an event which has very big weight. They have to associate together at least three stations with one source. Uh, some small details uh, as well described. Uh, but this is the most important. Oops. This is the most important difference uh, for aut uh, automatic processing and uh, uh, analysis, as we, as we call it. Uh, automatic processing is not yet too much reliable, and uh, we have human intervention in the process to make the product very good. So we are talking about the seismic, and this is the kind of, uh, most of the events in our bulletin are based on seismic waves, including the all GPRK events, all six explosions. So the seismic uh, waves produce most of the events. That's why uh, I started from that. And uh, this is uh, not the <laughs> technology which is better than other technologies because each technology serves for the specific task. But at least it's most prolific in terms of our volatile. Uh, but uh, we have two uh, other very important uh, technologies, which is hydroacoustic and um, Infrasound, and they are processed similar way. So the, all the concept, almost all the concept, uh, are the same. But the waveforms, the structure, and so on, a bit different between technologies. So we cannot just use one processing seismic to infrasound and to hydroacoustic same way. So we have kind of differences between them, despite that most of the uh, uh, processes are the same. So you saw already that picture, I hope. So this is a kind of nuclear test. Uh, it can be above the uh, surface, below the surface, or even underground. And we still may have hydroacoustic signals from underground tests. And we did uh, have signal from the TPRK-6 in 2017 at uh, some hydroacoustic uh, stations. Uh, the signals which are relevant to our processing, relevant to the bulletin, are age phase in water age phase. This is a phase which I hope already is described here, which may belong to the underground, underwater, sorry, I am seismologist, underwater uh, explosion. When we have seismic wave uh, at, uh, measured at, uh, at hydroacoustic station, if the wave coming to the bottom of the ocean is big enough, it propagates into the water and touches the sensors. And when we see at hydroacoustic station seismic signals, it's the same with even infrasound. Sometimes we see at infrasound sensors seismic signals. If the signal is big enough, if it moves the surface, the motion of the surface creates infrasound signals. And so-called T-phase, which is usually related to the uh, transfer of energy from the land into the ocean at the slopes or between at shore slopes. So uh, this type of phase is most important for us. And if we see them, then our uh, we can make them defining uh, in event building. So I said that we discussed only seismic waves, but such waves can bring some information about source in water, and that's why we consider all uh, hydroacoustic stations as primary stations, which built event. And that kind of phase is used to build event. These stations, these kind of signals can build event, but it, the event should be so much big that all stations, uh, seismic stations all over the world detect it. It's small addition to the solution which has 100 stations already. And this is 
important wave, but it cannot be defi defining because we don't know, we cannot predict the travel time of that curve. It has one leg in land, one in water, and we don't know what is the ratio between that legs. So we don't, we cannot predict as we have the infrasound prediction when the wave comes to you, to you, and to the fever. But that wave, we don't know where it was and what, what is the travel time in land and travel time in water. So we don't use it to be defining. So we have quite a few signals which you, I hope, already are the, the previous presenters, uh, I, I hope, talked about them. And this is a typical hydrophone uh, station. I will uh, discuss the processing of that. So here, uh, it's usually uh, three part height. So three sensors dis with a uh, distance of a few kilometers. So it's not like in seismic when we have uh, sensors every few hundred meters. Here we have only three sensors. They are very expensive, that's, that's the reason. They could put more, <laughs> but then it costs more. Uh, but uh, typical for a hydroacoustic station. So the processing, which is uh, network processing, uh, is the same. So we have detections and some stations, the project back travel times and try to find the source which emitted that uh, signals which are detected at uh, different uh, stations. And for example, we used that method uh, to try to locate the submarine, uh, Argentinian submarine, because uh, we had signals uh, from that submarine at a few stations. So we could predict the position of that uh, submarine. Uh, and they had also a small explosion test, which we also located. And we could even estimate the distance between the short and the uh, submarine explosion. Uh, but otherwise, the processing is the same. Uh, the hydroacoustic network uh, and here it's shown the, I, I, I think you uh, saw that already. So this is uh, how big event, uh, how small event should be actually for hydroacoustic, for us to detect it, uh, to find it. And uh, you see that it's one kilogram in some areas. So it means we have uh, events in our bulletin which are one kilogram big. So n nothing more about uh, hydroacoustic except that we, they use kind of, uh, instead of beam forming as summation of waveforms, they use cross correlation between three waveforms to make sure that the slowness and azimuth are estimated well uh, by time delays between most coinciding uh, waveforms at uh, three stations. So this is a kind of uh, beam forming, but it's different because the distance between uh, sensors is too big relative to seismic, and we lose phase information over that distance. So infrasound, I think you saw that picture, yeah, already. This is kind of sources of infrasound. This is kind of a sample wind for some day, and you see how strong wind can be and of course, uh, this makes the conditions for propagation in one direction much better than in another direction. And sometimes, uh, half a year, we see uh, signals uh, from the same mine in one direction and another half a year in different direction because the wind changes from east to west, east to west, uh, every six months. So, but uh, it just to show that the processing of that is extremely sophisticated. It needs to be, uh, it's needed to use information of winds on uh, uh, distribution of temperature to make the prediction of travel time better. So, and here is an example of uh, uh, detection of a Russian fireball, which was in February 2013. And if you please. Uh, 
and you will, you will see the fireball. Hope. But maybe you already saw it. So it was very big, 300 kiloton, approximately. I mean, I, I, different people give different yield. But uh, the picture here shows that this is first run. This is second circumnavigation at one time circle over the globe and comes to the same station here. And this is third time. It's a few days took for the wave to come. Uh, and we had estimates of azimuth and uh, velocity of that wave uh, for infrasound. So it's uh, exciting. We need in in infrasound stations not only for these, but this is kind of a nuclear test in atmosphere and we know that we can detect it. So this is interactive analysis. This picture approximately 20 years old and nothing, not too much changed for work of analysts, uh, but we have more fancy tools. Uh, again, uh, we get the pipeline and now we go to the post-analysis pipelines and here we go to event screening, which is most sensitive. What does mean event screening? As I mentioned before, for each event we have to test a hypothesis that this event is a natural earthquake. And if the hypothesis survives, we move it in a special place and don't consider anymore because we know this is earthquake, it's not relevant to the treaty to, to the mandate. Uh, so there are few uh, possibilities to screen the natural events. Uh, or to estimate that this event is not maybe natural, it's other way around. So first of all, it's MBMS uh, difference. The second is seismic depth. So we know that if the event has a depth of 100 kilometers, so nobody will suggest that this is a nuclear test. Uh, when we have uh, regional P2S amplitude ratios, which is same as MBMS, but at uh, closer distances. And finally, this is uh, hydroacoustic, uh, high frequency energy reverberations, which we studied with capsule analysis. We use now for that technologies to screen out events, but there are many opportunities other of that, but they are not tested well yet. First of all, it's uh, MB minus MS. So the explosion and earthquake natural event have quite different uh, emission of uh, seismic wave. Explosion is compression, you know, it goes whoosh. And uh, the earthquake usually is a rupture, it's a shear wave, shear. So uh, MB says how much energy is in compression in P wave, and MS says how much energy is in surface wave, which is mostly shear wave related. So that's why the general rule says MB for explosions bigger than MS because it's compression, it's big, it's strong. And shear, it's, it's not so good in P wave production, but very good in shear wave production. Uh, if we plot the measurements of the same uh, event uh, on MBMS uh, scales, then these are mainly earthquakes. Uh, and this is the decision line that says these are earthquakes. So all events which have MB minus MS here are natural. We screen them out yeah, because they have a lot of MS, big MS, and relatively small, relatively small MB, body wave magnitude. Uh, these are some nuclear tests. It's uh, in China, in Pakistan, in India, and here uh, it's DPRK, nine and uh, okay and you see that yeah 
this is the decision line which was before. And when we get that, we learn that sometimes explosions can generate a lot of MS, uh, the shear wave or surface wave, and we have to be very careful in drawing such lines from the history. And now we have this line. And you see, it's safe. Now it's below the decision line. We did not screen out it. It is nuclear test, because we know that it is nuclear test, but it belongs to a population of not screened out events. Uh, what is the problem? The problem is that a lot of earthquakes now in the same population. So we have to consider them as not screened out. That means that we have to explain why we do not consider them as natural events, because they are looking like explosions. Second is uh, M uh, the P2S ratio at regional distances. These are two waveforms uh, from DPRK. This is DPRK1, and this is one of the earthquakes which is nearby. You see the P wave is big from the explosion, and here is no wave which should be like here, which is LG wave, it's shear wave, but P small. So if we divide this by the amplitude here, it will be a big number. But if we divide here this amplitude by this amplitude, it's a small number. Yeah? This amplitude is small, this big, and division will be kind of 0.1. But if we divide this by this, amplitude will be, the ratio will be 10. So the difference is 100 times. Of course, this is illustration, and not so easy everything. So we have uh, some explosions which look like earthquakes and some earthquakes which look like explosion for that P2S ratio. Uh, the another one is uh, the hydroacoustic screening. Uh, if it's underwater explosion, it creates a bubble of a hot gas and that bubble reverberates going up and reverberates. So it's like a bell. What the uh, you know about bells that they give you very sharp sound, very sharp frequency, yeah? and the bubble gives also also very sharp frequency, and we can get uh, that frequency from the waveforms and found that the uh, this is a bubble, and if we have that uh, peak on frequency, we say okay, this is underwater explosion, and this is not natural event. Okay, so here this uh, summary of uh, application of uh, screen criteria uh, to uh, data in 2016, where there were 37,000 events, and to each of each of that event we applied all we calculated values of all criteria, and uh, the final distribution is this one is not considered. There are some small events which are so small that we cannot resolve their nature. We just say we cannot consider them because we need some more information to be able to resolve their nature. Uh, some events do not have, for example, MS, and that we say, okay, this is non-sufficient data. We, we cannot resolve because no of the parameter, no of the our screen parameters or scores can be calculated. So we cannot say something specific of, of that event. Uh, and this is 16 percent. Next is not screened out. These are events which have some negative scores and the nuclear test should be in that port, not screened out. And there are 20, uh, 12 percent of uh, not screened out events and screened out events which belong to a population of earthquakes. So that take approximately 33%. So we have quite a few events to consider next uh, as potential nuclear tests. And finally about uh, the fusion. So the question is, we have hydroacoustic seismic infrasound and they are all separated. Can we put them together somehow? Can we use the seismic wave from underwater uh, event, or can we use uh, 
infrasound wave from underground explosion, uh, and so on. And here we don't consider the radionuclides because radionuclides uh, come to tomorrow together with ATM, which is a driver of a fusion between SHI, seismic hydroacoustic infrasound technologies, and radionuclides. But today we, we are talking about all, only about waveform data fusion usage of uh, data from different technology, technologies together. And here is one example which uh, shows that the event here. Uh, first, they were detected at hydroacoustic stations. You know, and we built an event because we had the azimuths and arrival times. And from azimuth and arrival times, we obtained the position of the event in water, which created that, generated that signals. But when the analyst came and looked into the data at seismic stations, and they found that, that stations corroborate, they support the hypothesis of uh, underwater event, which was detected by two hydroacoustic stations. And here you see hydroacoustic phase, which is H, type, which we can use as defining a few PN phases, which is regional or primary phases, and in, in our uh, station, and they are ordered in distance. So this is the example of a fusion of a data. We have much more many examples of a fusion of data, hydroacoustic infrasound and seismic together, but uh, this is time to finish and thank you for your attention and we have some time for questions, if you have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to Ivan for the uh, very detailed presentation. Uh, I see it stunned everybody into silence at the end. Uh, but uh, if you let that sink in and you do have any uh, more questions um, on these and other issues, we, as I said, will be happy to direct them in the, uh, to the right uh, people. This brings us to the end of today's uh, session. We will uh, continue on tomorrow morning. Uh, with a, uh, a range of presentations and discussions. We're going to continue looking into the verification regime, drilling down into radionuclide issues in the morning before looking at atmospheric transport modeling. One thing I really want to draw your attention to is the technical keynote that we will have tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. with the eminent professor Paul Richards on verifying a nuclear test ban, a historical perspective. I think this is something that will be of interest to everybody uh, here in the room. And we will also then have a session on detecting the DPRK nuclear tests, which I think you will find very interesting, looking into how our experts uh, monitored and detected uh, each of the six nuclear tests announced uh, by North Korea. We'll have a session on the civil and scientific applications uh, of CTBT data, looking at all of these extra spin-offs that I mentioned yesterday that are available from our data. And then we will have a briefing on the Virtual Data Exploitation Center. So that, that's a whole day of CTBT data and CTV, CTBT verification technologies uh, in store for you tomorrow. Uh, can I remind you again, if you haven't done so, to check the lists, the sign-up lists for the visit to the Atom Institute next Monday. Uh, we do need you to tick off your names on that in order to make sure that transport arrangements are properly made. So that's uh, one thing I would uh, ask you to do. Um, apart from that, I would just remind you of the existence of our CTBTO events app if you don't have it um, and you don't have a uh, code that you need to download it, our colleagues can uh, help you out with that. Uh, the app has been updated to contain uh, some uh, new information including the 
first uh, roundup of the of the CDBTO youth group uh, newsroom document, so please do have a look at that. And there is also uh, some information there on the social wall element as well, so, so please uh, check that out. So with that, I uh, wish you a pleasant evening, and we'll see you all together uh, again bright and early tomorrow at 9 a.m. Thank you.